Welcome dear participants on the day 3 of the UGC DE consortium national awareness workshop on its science uh, scientific research facilities it has been a wonderful experience to listen the experts from UGC DE CSR so for putting the brief report of yesterday's lectures and introducing today's speakers i humbly invite dr sudhendra rai prawl from ugc csr mumbai center welcome sir thank you dr shamalke and good morning to you and all the participants and to all my colleagues and uh, resource persons uh, yesterday we on the second day of our uh, workshop we had the opportunity of uh, listening to the facilities and getting an idea of the kind of uh, research being carried out at indoor center of the consortium and we also had a very uh, elaborate talk and uh, detailed discussion regarding the facilities available at indus synchrotron and what kind of research can be carried out using those facilities so in continuation of our uh, series uh, for in today's lectures we will be having opportunity to know what are the facilities available at the kalpakam center and the kalpakam node as well as at the kolkata center so to begin today's proceeding uh, dr s s gugre from uh, kolkata center will be uh, telling us about the kind of research activities and facilities which are available at uh, uh, kolkata center so we can start our proceedings of the day with the uh, lectures lecture from dr gugre and i invite dr gugre to please start his lecture uh, over to you dr gugre please Hi, uh, Gugre sir, your uh, your your camera. I I have just switched it off. I'll put it on at the end if you don't mind. No issue, sir. You are, then uh, please uh, share your slide so that we can put Hi. it live. Okay. It is there. It's there. My slide is on. The first slide is blank always. Uh, then. Yeah. Can you see it? No, sir. Uh, it might be there. Coming, coming, coming. Uh, maybe. It's not uh, right now. I can't see. Okay. I can see it here. Okay, right now let me stop sharing first. Hold on. Ah. Now you share, sir. Yeah, I have I have kept it in the sharing mode only. Just a minute. Uh, it might be a little bit lag there today. Can you see it? Ah. Uh, sir, अब एक बार stop करके फिर से share करेंगे. इनवाइट डॉक्टर एस एस घुगरे from calcutta center for his expert lecture uh, in a few seconds you are going to see his uh, slides uh, sir put your my first uh, slide is blank my first slide is blank uh, yeah so okay that's fine okay sir oh. okay uh, 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 good sir. morning yeah good morning and suprabhat to all i would take this opportunity to thank the organizers for giving me a unique opportunity Uh, to come and present to you, uh, and I say this opportunity is very unique because we at the Calcutta Center come from the land of Ganga Sagar, and uh, besides the other thing, I'll in my try talk try to tell you how we have used the, the diversity of Ganga, the Sundarbans, to carry out research, and it's a pleasure and a privilege for me to talk from the land of Ganga Sagar in a conference that's been uh, organized in the land of Deprayag. from where the confluence of bhagirathi and alaknanda gives rise to the holy river maganga so i said that it's a very unique opportunity and i look forward that uh, to have a, a collaboration develop from the holy land to the cultural capital of the city as i said my task that was uh, given to me was to talk about the overview of the research facility at the kolkata center Uh, but then i decided to add two lines to it uh, just a couple of words uh, which as i said your university is blessed with a visionary uh, 
leader in honorable vice chancellor who talked about removing the compartmentalization of education and by education i mean both formal as well as the research and so when i'm talking about the overview of the research facilities i'll try to talk about how we address the question towards the next science and by next i mean today is the is the time where everybody talks of the multidisciplinary aspects of research and as i said i we at calcutta center are uh, always uh, uh, in our shadow of a big brother the indoor center which has the best facilities as far as material characterization is, is is concerned and of course mumbai which is a unique facility of the neutron so how do we stay alive in the business i will try to impress upon you that we try to do things a bit little differently and i am reminded of the famous uh, words by robert frost i took the word road that was left said all that all the difference and i'll try to show you how we try to a kind of have a synergy between the various research facilities we have to address this issue so if i were to say what i do in calcutta i would say we are involved in radiation based research in pure and of course a pure science today people may debate about it over a cup of coffee that it does have a lot of spin off when i talk about the interdisciplinary science so radiation is a central theme which binds all my colleagues at calcutta center and we are involved in utilizing the accelerator based facilities and programs of the department of atomic energy as i said it was only after the confluence of hagirathi and alaknanda that we have the significance of ganga so also i believe in today's world uh, we really need a, a synergy a confluence of sangam of the department of atomic energy which is a large mega science facility and the universities which have the large human resource pool and it is up to us at the ugcd uh, uh, csr center to bring about this synergy so broadly speaking we use electromagnetic and particle radiation for investigating matter and matter to me retains both living as well as non living so you'll find during my 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 presentations i'll run through studies on living matter and as well as non living uh, the matter both of which give us interesting facets about the study that we have taken and having uh, uh coming from calcutta and bengal i do have to uh, pay my homage to the uh, to the legendary gurudev and i'm sure when he wrote his poem if i tweak the two words of his very famous poem i'll say the calcutta center is where science comes out from the depth of gamma rays and gamma rays are just used as a symbol to to represent Uh, uh, radiation. Now, as I said, the Calcutta Center uh, is located right now. We are located in the, and we have a beautiful synergy between Calcutta Center and the university, as we are located in the Salt Lake campus of Jadavpur University, and it facilitates the utilization of the mother of all accelerators in the country, the Variable Energy Cyclotron Center, a room temperature cyclotron facility. which is a unique facility in the sense that it is entirely indigenous facility developed way back decades ago and it's still running and giving us beams as i i i i will run you through them which are keeping us alive and in, in this competitive age uh, anybody who wants to write you can write to dr saha who is our, uh, our, our our center director and as i said so if you need to use any accelerator you need to come and talk to us Uh, and, and 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 of course besides the actual facility we have complementary uh, facilities developed at the center which add our two cents worth of importance in the utilization of these facilities as i said we also look at the coordination of the 3 mv uh, tandem facility at iop bhuvneshwar it is extensively used by my colleagues across the uh, across the country and in nuclear physics uh, 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 especially we also take care of the utilization of the uh, brc tfr linear uh, linear peloton facility so the calcutta center in some sense looks at all the accelerator facility across the country except of course the dua reactor now how do you know about us uh, so on the in this age of digital technology we have our website the calcutta center also has a modest 
small uh, website you come to know through uh, about us through the sayog and our my, and the annual reports as i said so this is our main uh, yeah, yesterday uh, the web page that uh, my my colleague uh, uh, that we talked about but as i said the calcutta center which we always believe in doing the things a bit different you see we have invested some efforts in trying to have a digital repository and i would request all the uh, people to come and take a look at this where this is the link we have and you will find we have tried to put information whatever i as it as i said continuously been upgraded and one of the most strong part is various lectures that have been given by us at formal post graduate levels as well as the other levels have been all uh, we are trying to actually have them all on the digital repository so besides the formal research material you may also find several useful material for teaching as 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 uh, yesterday we had said they are available to all the research group uh, and educational institutes and uh, as i said uh, we have a one time use here i like to draw your attention since we have a lot of people, participants from uh, from the uh, engineering part the nuclear physics group caters specifically to the uh, a course in formal nuclear power engineering and nuclear instrumentation and as uh, during the inauguration the honorable vice chancellor has said that you need to have visits here i would humbly disagree with uh, them that a visit is nothing more than a trip what we have been doing for the universities is we have advanced mini schools for post graduate students a part of their formal education Are, are the formal curriculum. So this is about a one weeks activity where the students come. We have lectures from the people. They actually do some experiments, the advanced level experiments, which are required for their curriculum. And unfortunately, because of lack of resources, they could not be done. So in some senses, I like to say that we are like the LIC ad. We are there before the uh, the student comes to research. We are there for the student when he comes to research. and most of the people have continued with us even after the research in various uh, capability and most of the workshops that we do are actually an extension of our family which was associated with us as users etc another important thing which i like to draw attention i'm sure dr simulti may be interested is this is a unique contribution from the calcutta center we uh, we have invested a substantial amount of time in trying to have an outreach program where we have developed innovative experiments for undergraduate physics and postgraduate physics students keeping in view the present ug and cpg credit based curriculum developed by the university we have also said now if you see there's a continuous focus on having uh, uh, computations being made a part of the integral formal course and in a sense we had actually a web based workshop or a, a faculty development program where we showed them how you can extend the educational ecosystem using technology so this is some of the our outreach programs and which as we say it's in our interest that if we are people uh, bloom right at the undergrad and grad uh, and the postgrad level it helps us get very good students for our own research so as i said like lic before research during research and after research if you need to talk to somebody that's us and as i said so this is a slide which really sums up what the calcutta center does so the calcutta center basically looks at a radiation as a tool to study nuclear physics radiation or macromolecular chemistry radiation biology uh, radio isotope sort of based material science studies and trace element studies so all there is a synergy with not only among the instruments that we use but also the central ethos of the thing so this would be a slide which i would say is my summary slide i always nowadays in the world of inverted pyramid i thought it's better that i put my slide the, uh, my my summary slide where we are, are using accelerators to do multi disciplinary science so that's the research program that is separated by uh, supported by the calcutta center you have experimental nuclear physics trace element sciences radiation biology and these are the people whom you should be talking to if you need to uh, any help in this and always if you have any other problem you can always talk to our, our our bosses because as i said the boss is always right and if you have any problems with uh, or trouble communicating to us you can always uh, get in touch with them so let me just spend a few minutes on facilities for the nuclear research uh, program at the calcutta center and as i said uh, we the nuclear physicists have always been called the unclear physicists by all all my colleagues 
primarily I have a tough time telling them, look, guys, when you work at the nano level, we at the nuclear physics have always been working at femto level. So if physics is interesting at the nano level, you can Im imagine the kind of interest we can we can generate when I talk of nuclear physics. And I thought I'll put up this slide because this is the slide of the various doctoral students that have been associated with us. And you'll see up to Rajeshri, all of them have got a job. So the job market, which finally is the end pro product of any human activity, let I see uh, all of them have been absorbed in the front ranking research institutes, educational institutes, thus speak volumes about the credit that uh, order to the training that we have been able to impart them. These three are our senior most graduating students whom to whom will be saying tata bye bye baby in the next couple of months. Uh, Kaushik and Mukesh are our technical people. Dr. Raut and Dr. Sinha, former director, have been a part of this. Basis. The beauty about the nuclear physics program is that the nucleus is a few body system. Few body system is that it's a between a two body problem, which I can solve quantum mechanically, as well as a many body problem, which can be solved macroscopically. So it basically gives me a unique laboratory to probe these two extreme modes, which we understand scientifically, or an interplay or coexistence of them. And what is most important, if I were talking to a, a humanities person, is it exact resemblance of a human society? By that, I mean it's intriguing, it's fascinating, and of course, intimidating at times. What we usually do is we have an inner system and I need to disturb the system. It's an inner system. It does not allow me to probe it. So what I do is I subject the system to an external vestibuli. Uh, exactly that's what we do. We subject the system of nucleons to an external stimuli of excitation energy, stain, temperature. I'm sure all my material science colleagues are fascinated by temperature and magnetic field. We also add our two cents worth of more excitation probe as the excitation energy and spin. And then how this inherent system responds to our external stimuli tells me about what is happening to this two body problem. And then if they have behaved coherently, they exhibit a certain kind of behavior. If they are incoherent, they exhibit a certain kind of behavior. So the imprint or the signature to this behavior, I'll go back one slide, is see that if I disturb this nuclei and all of them coherently respond, I get a beautiful manifestation as an orderly phenomenon. If there are disturbing elements which we always have in human society, you will get some kind of complex situation. So it is the signature which tells us how the system has behaved. And that is why it's important for us to study the various signals. Hello, am I? Hello. Sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. You are visible. Okay. No sure. okay. Please Thanks. continue. So as I said, the gamma ray spectroscopy is we are, we are involved very much in the activities of the Indian National Gamma Array. And we take some pride in saying the I in INGA actually stands for IUCDF. That's what we were first initially called when we started this business. So the Indian National Gamma Ray is the largest national collaboration in nuclear physics. And for the first time, all the stakeholders, DAE, UGC, research institutes, colleges, schools have come together in this national collaboration, wherein the resources have been pulled from Tata Institute, uh, the, uh, the NSC, VEC, SINP and us, and we have set up a major array and the unique part is that it moves along the three accelerator center, VECC at Calcutta, NSC at Delhi, and TIFR at Mumbai, so that it, people can do various experiments. So this would be the INGA facility at the VECC. It's currently operational at VCC where we have about the 10 floor, and this is the best array as of now if you are to do nuclear physics. It is, uh, yeah, it is set up at the K3 of the room temperature cyclotron, the mother of all accelerators, which is very unique that it gives us high energy alpha beams, which besides nuclear physics are very useful in material science to do kind of radiation damage. And so VC provides a very unique feature in giving me energetic 
light ion beam which allows us to probe uh, material deformation or nuclear physics at the domain of energy not accessible through the heavy ion accelerators and very recently we have again re-energized the heavy ion beam project and it gives us heavy ion beams of inert gases. So if you need neon argon for your study, none of the two heavy ion accelerators at Delhi and Bombay can give you. You need to visit the mother of all accelerators. So the high energy alpha beam and the high energy inert gas gives us the cutting edge over most of the people. This was one of the slides that I decided to show for Inga is if you see Inga was entirely run. This is the entire group which runs Inga and you will see no gray head or a pot bellied person because it's actually run by students and young faculty. If you see the students are actually repairing a clover detector, a very complicated system and we have de uh, developed the expertise to service semiconductor detectors indigenously. I think that is a major option for us. Uh, the, as I said, uh, we have the electronics for this. I'll not go into it. The Kolkata Center has is the resource person for providing the digital data acquisition system for the INGA facility. As I said, you buy an equipment, the hardware, the entire firmware was conceptualized by us in collaboration with the manufacturer and this is the first time we have successfully ported the knowledge and expertise of pulse processing we have over two decades into the digital domain that gives us the best of both the worlds. It gives us the flexibility and the speed for which we have been able to do very unique experiments not possible currently using Inga if it were at any other place. So we have added some unique features. Of course, as I said, we really don't go into base zero level of development, but this is what we have developed is in the digital signal processing, which is an outcome of several ME thesis, which our students, we have support from Jadavpur University and their students actually do a formal ME course with us on nuclear instrumentation as, as well as this. So we actually help enhance the quality of education as well in the university. So this is what we have been able to uh, achieve. If you go to any accelerator facility, you are uh, 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 running Inga, you will have a room full of electronics. So this is the electro indigenously developed electronic. This I must say my colleagues at IUSC have done a fantastic job while developing indigenous electronics. But you would need a room full of electro. All these are used. This has now been condensed to just one crate. So I can pack it in my suitcase literally and move it. So what we have been able to do in terms of talking in terms of colloquialism, entire room has been condensed into a more efficient digital dive. Of course, we learned a lot from this and we have been able to successfully port it. Now what do I do when I have I have such a question? I know that I have given a nucleus. We all know manual molecular spectroscopy, you will have a rotational spectra which looks like this which is manifested in evenly spaced gamma rays. So that is how a nucleus would respond to angular momentum if it was imposed collectively. Now, if I have a triaxial nucleus, what is a triaxial nucleus? It has three principal axes which are unequal. So if I rotate the nucleus, I can have the angular momentum components of the pore, the particle outside it, and the total angular momentum possible about any of these three axes. And it really that this is the quantum analog of a spinning top that or the precision or a wobbling that comes up in the macroscopic world is manifested in this kind of a thing. And we could be able and the way it as I told you the signature is in the gamma rays. And if we are able to study the gamma rays and characterize them, we then conjecture about what was the motion in the nucleus and what happened to it. And this, as I said, was uh, we, we had this uh, reported in the recent PRL letter. So this is a PRL which has come out from Inga at VCC, where you can see the entire IUC group, including our students, are an important uh, part, uh, uh, a position in the author list which speaks for our contribution in it. And if you see the, the paper, as I said, it is possible when you try to characterize the gamma in terms of angular momentum, it's a multipolarity, which was possible, 
not only because of our data acquisition system, but we call our analysis package the IUC picks. Unfortunately, we have continued with our name IUC, and so for historical reasons, it remains so. As I said, this is the kind of contribution the nuclear physics group has been able to add to research uh, level where we have a publication in one of the best journals which we can hope for. For as I said, had did we stop there, or did we take this a bit further, or are, is our research only limited in a laboratory uh, where which has no social societal relevance? Uh, relevance. So this is our CSR activity, where you know that all colleges or uh, uh, postgraduate levels have uh, experiment on using nuclear detectors. If you use a nuclear detector, it's extremely costly because along with the detector, you need a whole lot of here a processing electronic. So what we did was we used our ex uh, expertise we had developed in doing the digital processing of the signal. All I needed was an efficient data acquisition system. And the then uh, director Dr. Sinha told me that, well, you have a sound card in the computer which has a very fast ADC and that's what all what you need. So what we actually did was we took the detector, took out its signal and put it in the sound card. We recorded the signal in a wave file, did all the signal processing in DSP based on the knowledge we had, we had uh, developed and we literally came out with a zero cost multi-channel analyzer. So all that the universities today need is a detector which all of them have a source which all of them have and PC which is there even in uh, nowadays they have they, they talk about when kids doing uh, a programming. So uh, we put this together and have come up with a zero cost multi channel analyzer which should address some of the limitations that people face in running a postgraduate course. We have also as I said we have used as, as the multidisciplinary nature comes in we also develop a portable radiation monitoring system, which is very useful and has a relevance in nuclear proliferation and nuclear security. So this is what we did was we had the detector signal, then use a very cheap solution of Arduino, which cost 400 bucks and a shield, another 400 bucks and converted into a wireless monitoring system, which can be used in field for doing any nuclear proliferation or nuclear cross checking activity. So as I said, this is what is there in almost all the departments that we have. We not only do pure science as we studied wobbling motion, we also try to use, uh, pass on the knowledge expertise that we have developed to our teaching colleagues as well as technology on the field. So now, as I said, with this, I come to an end of my nuclear physics part. So let me just change gears and go to something else. So as I said, the Calcutta Center does nuclear physics, chemistry, biology. So I'll keep on shifting and dancing back and forth between various topics. I apologize for that, but somehow I'll try to bring about a synergy between them. So now let me talk about the radiation and macromolecular chemistry group that we have, which is headed by Dr. Saha, our center director. Recently, we have Dr. Gautam Pramanik, who has who have joined us. So if you wanted to do anything about chemistry, it may be kitchen chemistry or the lab chemistry. These are the people you all need to talk to about. So one of, as I said, it is the radiation, which is the central theme for all activities at Calculus Center. Radiation, as I said, not only deals with radiation available from the accelerator facilities, but let me talk, uh, we also have an in-house gamma irradiation facility. I'm sure the moment I talk about this facility, it brings to mind the experience or that we had with our friends and colleagues at Delhi University. So having learned from that, we definitely take a lot of precautions when we are handling such a strong source of gamma irradiation. So cobalt 60, that is the mother of all uh, radiation based sources that you could you would look forward. So as I said, we have a gamma source from Brit. It's quite strong. I, I can tell you what was the count rate right now. So what you're seeing is this is a central feature which has the gamma ray source. This is the moment you have this part that you see it allows you to mount your target. Then it is lowered in. It goes and sits inside and you have a radiation of the gamma ray. So is it a fill and forget story? No, we also have facilities 
for doing an online monitoring of the studies that are going on. And as I said, it looks very simple that I've just pulled out two wires, but believe me, it's not a trivial task to derive online signals in situ from any radiation based experiment. So this gamma ray facility has a very uniform dose. You can control the temperature. You can also do an online monitoring thing. So as I said, we at the Calcutta Center use radiation to talk about living and non-living things. This is an example where radiation has been used to address a very important topic in living things. Of course, by the time they study, the guys are no longer living. But as I said, it's the supreme sacrifice of all these animals which help us study and know how we make the, uh, the today's medicinal technology better and profitable. So this was a study made by a colleague from the Calcutta University where they, their aim was that today we always talk of radiation-based therapy for cancer cells. But of course, as, they, as we say, there are no free lunches. This uh, treatment, line of treatment has certain limitations. And the most important uh, limitation is after some time, there's a resistance against drugs and radiation. So I really need to take care that I avoid the radio since, uh, since, since I try to enhance the radiation sensitivity of the organs that I gave. And the colleagues uh, from the Calcutta Union found out that if you use ferulic acid, it, there is an enhanced radiation sensitivity and the problems that we face of a development to res resistance to drugs and radiation post the initial recycle can be addressed effectively. So it was found that they studied, they used the gamma radiation as the source of radiation. They treated their specimens to ferulic acid. Of course, it's, uh, not, I'm just, it's uh, much more complicated. People who are in the line would definitely uh, understand the nitty gritty involved. And they studied it using some of the facilities in our bio lab. So we had the radiation source provided by a chemistry group, uh, analysis facility provided by a bio group. Put it together, you have a wonderful concoction of a kind of uh, research which has potential in elevating some of the current problems, bottlenecks uh, people are facing in the uh, recent times of our treatment. So this is an example where I'll talk about the gamma radiation which has been used to study living. Give me a couple of minutes. I'll show how we also talk about the non-living and they equally give us very important results. Chemists are always fascinated by spectroscopy. So we have uh, optical spectroscopy give, uh, provided to you by the visible and near infrared spectrometer and the uh, luminescence spectrometer which also has facilities for doing some low temperature luminescence studies. You can have the, uh, the spectrometers. These are the parameters. I really am not an expert in it, but just I'm told that you have uh, various facilities which uniquely coupled with a mix and match situation can enhance the sensitivity of your measurements. And you would be able to actually do extremely good research. We all, they also have what we call is the single. Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK, OK. Hey, well, okay sir. Please continue. The voice is breaking. Yeah. So there's some. Hello. Yeah, no, voice you, yeah. Is breaking. yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, yes, sir. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. OK, OK. There is a little so, issue with the speaker. Rest OK. Okay, okay. Uh, I little my... issue with the mic. Okay, uh, okay. that's fine. Uh, can you hear me now? Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it might be the I... positioning I... of the mic. Uh, I... It I... might okay. be the positioning of the mic. Okay, please. Okay, okay, fine. Thank you. Okay, so what they have is a very wonderful equipment, uh, which is the single photon counting system, where the measurements can be done in both steady state and the time domain. Phosphorescence measurements can also be performed. It allows us to do measurements in liquid and solid and thin film. That's all what you could ask for. You have a wide range of temperature, which gives me one more parameter to study my crystal. Uh, they have a xenon uh, uh, light source, is a 450 watt xenon short arc lamp. 
they also hello they also have uh, interchangeable I, leds and kind of various attachments so what am i talking about when i talk about this kind of a facility whenever i'm talking about lifetime the typical measurement which we all do whether it's a cyclotron electron is that you have a start signal you don't really have one unit start system but you have a bunch of well spaced start signals so these basically signals gives you the population it kind of you have to go to the next slide on arrival of this ai radiation it sets up my molecules into excitation and then subsequently as i am not an expert but this is what we all know from what we use in our scintillators is that once you excite the system it goes to singlet triplet state you have a radiationless decay it decays onto a metastable state and the subsequent decay from this gives us all interesting physics and this decay the time the, as i told you by stokes law we know that the excitation and de excitation wavelengths are to be separate this is what causes the separate separate uh, separation of these excitations and depending on the time delay they are classified as fluorescence or phosphorescence and so on so the basic principle is you excite something let it de excite at a time level where you can measure this gives you all kinds of fascinating information so what you would have is a repetitive pulse as your source of excitation it sets up an excitation and then you will start your decay so when the decay occurs basically you uh, measure the time between the excitation and the decay easier said than done because what we use is basically we would start charging of a capacitor when the pulse arrives and stop it when the decay occurs now my colleagues from the engineering science can know the charging of a capacitor is a highly exponential phenomena the entire money goes into making that exponential phenomena into a linear but that is done in what we call the time to amplitude converter which converts the time difference between the arrival and the stop into a voltage the voltage is then converted into a, a digital number and that number gives me the time between the excitation and the subsequent excitation and this is what you would get a spectrum like this of course this gives me the for the blue curve is the prompt resolution and this is the spectrum that you get so depending on the time the uh, of the decay that's where all the fascinating physics or chemistry lies and that is what they have been using in for doing all these so this is a very unique facility that they have single for time correlated single photon counting system i told i have tried to give you a back of the envelope working principle but actually principle is much complicated but as i said that's not the matter of discussion for today they also have an ftir which has the mid and far region uh, capabilities they are with having a thick cell window for non hygroscopic and hygroscopic material so basically this kind of tells you that if you have a given material we would be able to do chemistry using it this is an important uh, That they have that is namely the dynamic light scattering facility which allows you to do size measurements in this region and it gives you an information on the zeta potential so if you are doing anything in nanos you really need like to have a, a measurement of your size and that's how we have that uh, equipment which allows gives me the possibility to do so how do you do that what we do is we know the famous thing that we have studied was the brownian motion so the dynamic light scattering is based on the principle of brownian motion that is particles when are dispersed in a liquid will have no preferred direction that is they can move equally in all directions and hence would undergo collisions whenever there is a collision we know there is going to be a transfer of energy now on an average this energy transfer is going to be constant but there's an intricate dependence on the size of the particle and smaller the particle greater is the velocity and vice versa so if i know the particle speed 
I'll be able to have some conjecture on the size of the particle. And this is given by the famous Stokes-Einstein equation, which correlates the translation or diffusional coefficient with the hydrodynamic radius. So we have a handle to measure the hydrodynamic radius based on the Brownian motion. This is just a slide which shows that it is easier said than done. And I'll just say that it has several advantages that you don't need any specific sample preparation. Measurements can be done in solid in solution phase. Time is very small and you have the knowledge of viscosity. And another important thing that comes into this is what whenever I have a particle, I will always talk of various surfaces. One, I talk of the particle surface. Then I talk of the stern layer, which is immediately bound to the particle surface and has a relation with the surface charge. And that will tell us some information about what things are happening at the surface. Following this layer, you will have another layer, which is called the slipping pane, which is the solvent, which is not bound or interacting with my particle. So a uh, knowledge of these three things would help us to know that if I have a particle, I apply an electric field, it will move towards the opposite side with a certain velocity. If the velocity is, uh, if I have an equal and opposite force given by the viscous drag, it moves with a constant velocity and the constant velocity then is dependent on the zeta potential. So using uh, zeta potential and the mobility, you are able to have information on the mobility, the surface charge, so on and so forth, which is of importance for the nanoscale. They also have a laser, uh, uh, very uh, robust uh, laser Raman system and a micro facility, which basically helps us probe the thermodynamics of the chemical reaction at a very sensitive level. So the research programs of them are basically, again, in today, anybody who will be nanoparticles, they want to have functional nanostructure materials which are based for sensing and bio and which have uh, radio sensitizers and protectors for uh, chemical mechanism and they also have trying to do capped nanoparticles which have relevance in biotechnology. This was an example where I have used the radiation hardened thing of my gamma ray uh, facility to study elect the damage that the electronics suffer in all mission control components especially in space they are bombarded by radiation. So the studying their performance under adverse radiation is very important for us to develop mission critical components. And that's what they have done where they bombarded certain electronic chip and they have found out that there's a failure occurring after a certain load. So this kind of sets a, sets a limit on what is the kind of radiation hardness they have and how do they they have also studied the structural modi uh, modification of DNA. We know that the NIR window from 650 to 900 nanometer is useful for studying several features such as autofluorescence and absorption. Silver cal calcinogides and narrowbands are very important in this same region. And they tried to study the interaction of semiconductor nanoparticles with nuclear acids that, that are tropical in bioorganic field. And how does it uh, kind of, what is the interaction that the DNA has had, how the ethylene bromide was used as a probe to uh, probe the interaction between silver sulfide nanoparticles with the DNA, because it's well known that ethylene bromide goes and sits between the two DNA, there's a kind of change of signal. So they have been able to study, pick up all the signals for this change using the fanciful uh, system that they have. They have also tried to look at the thermodynamic measurements. As I told you, when you have two particles come together, the chemistry will tell you that there's going to be heat exchange. You can pick up those signals of heat exchange. However, so weak they may be, they tell you something about it. They also looked at the circular dichromatism of the DNA, which is a left-handed and right-handed thing. And they were able to show that binding of silver sulfide nanoparticles are mainly blue binding. So this kind of the silver sulfide goes and sits between 2NA, DNA, and there's obviously a change in their characteristic, which can be have a positive or a negative uh, effect. And study of that itself is of very important relevance. This was a very interesting study done by, again, some of our colleagues from the Tejpur University when they looked at the tungsten disulfide material. This tungsten disulfide material, their motivation was to create point effect reaction and see how and what 
properties change. So they did and exfoliated the bulk tungsten disulfide into a two layer system. Then it was then these two layer system were subjected to the photons and the photons were provided by our gamma ray source. So what they did was they have seen that there were defects which are obviously created and whenever you had radiation as the dose defected, they were able to create point defects and they had an hexagonal, uh, hexagonal atomic arrangement and there was a signature for point defects after radiation. Then they also saw that when they studied the thing as a function of dose, there was a declining trend in the sulfur to tungsten value and it was definitely evidence for the presence of sulfur defects. That is, the sulfur was affected in some way different way other than the, uh, than the tungsten. And they found out that there was emergence of an another phase which was introduced because of my irradiation. And this phase caused what we understand is kind of a change in the lifetime. As I said, the lifetime depends on these intermediate phases that are created and a study of the lifetime that I showed you having different slope gave you rise to the different components that are created in different. So that's what they did. Uh, and now I'd like to change over uh, to an another topic. But before I change over, are there any questions or anything on this before I go ahead? Uh, Dr. Gugra, you can continue. We can take questions at the end of the lecture. <laughs> So now, as, as I said, I have been talking about physics and chemistry. Let me go and talk about something else. If you see, I'll be talking, it's very difficult to see this slide intentionally because I'm going to talk about trace elements. And as the name suggests, they are really trace. We are talking about parts per million, a few parts per million. But the beauty of this is it has the it has, we always say that age does not matter, but some great philosopher has said, but size does. So by size, I mean quantity for me. So it has been seen that trace elements, which are present in extremely small quantities, are very essential for our life as we say. It. By life, I would mean us as well as the environment. And there is a synergy between these trace elements. Now, these trace elements, even though present in absolute microscopic quantity, have a very dual edge, are like a dual edge type. You need them, but if their concentration or presence increases or decreases, it can be lethal at times. And hence, we have a need for a detailed investigation on these trace elements, uh, uh, the elements which have a very important role if you're talking about environment, life science, archaeology, electronics, you name a branch of modern day science and trace element is of relevance there. So what, what do you do? It's very simple. I know that the signature of an element is its electronic excitation, which is manifested as an excitation. So if I have a source of excitation, I can knock out an electron, the electron gets filled up by an uh, electron from higher orbit, resulting in the emission of the X. And these X-rays are the fingerprint of the element present. And it is the fingerprint is so fine that I can pick out elements having a concentration of the level of parts per million from the part. And as I said, this is something you will be, uh, so I would need to have an incident radiation and the advantage of, because we usually, the nuclear physics people like to talk, before we do anything, we like to do simulation. So we use our simulation knowledge from nuclear physics to see that if I have a source of, I have some source where I excite either iron or copper, you will see that they give me different signals. So these are my iron x-rays, these are my copper x-rays. So this is what we would try to impress upon all the researchers today. Because many a time today, doing a PhD has boiled down to just collating some pictures that are given by the lab technician. So we believe that we should train the students slightly differently 
and before they go they should be able to have some knowledge of what they expect before they can do this experiment so this is what we just translated our, our simulation knowledge from nuclear physics to do some simulations in the energy dispersive x-ray fluorescence where the x-rays give us the fingerprints of the elements present now what so basically as i told you i need a source to excite the atoms or create vacancy that can be done either using a lab source or using a 3 mv proton for this i need to go to an accelerator facility while well, this is available to us in the lab so i have an x-ray tube which basically act, provides me the excitation on my sample the subsequent de excitation is detected by detector and these x-rays that i talked about are the fingerprints of what is the material that is present so they have been as i said we have huge lot of a truly multidisciplinary facility that we have when we try to look for trace elements in uh the uh, of relevance for environmental bio anything you name it and the application is there but basically as we decided that we need some home based thing so this is where the x ray source excitation source is a lab source here is an accelerator which gives me 3 mv proton these protons excite or create a vacancy it gets de excited by the and resulting in the emission of an x so as i said we also have what we call uh, we have an uh, edxrf we have extended the facility to do a micro edxrf by micro edxrf i mean it allows me to have a special information on my specimen i it's like scanning my specimen in every steps of some step which i'm told is about 10 micron so not only i get information on the bulk but it may so happen that these trace elements are preferentially present in certain places which is of relevance especially for biology so i can not only know what are the elements present but i know where they are present in which part of the leaf they are present and which gives us a very vital information on some uh, uh, topic that we are uh, being investigated so as i said before it is a before we go and doing about all these things you need an elaborate clean sample preparation techniques which involve freeze drying you make a pellets out of it you try to do some titration have them it on the filter paper if we are talking about liquids you try to filter them you have a pre concentrate them on the filter paper and what we have been able to do is that we have done an octagonal target ladder where we go for experiments for pixie so you see you can look at the number of samples you can mount and because of this we have really reduced the because whenever you do an experiment there is lot of preparatory time you have substantially cut down that time because of this so as i told you i come from the land of ganga sagar and at ganga sagar gives me sundarbans which is there in uh, in bangladesh as well as in india this represents the indian part and sundarban is definitely well known for the tigers but also it's a very fertile ground to study tree elements and they are effect and our understanding of the entire cycle chain so there have been several studies on this uh, the ganga sagar where we look for trace elements and what is most important is the trace elements are non degradable so they remain in my environment and therefore they are an environmental concern add to that the sundarban has a multivariate problem because of periodic tides just to give you the water level changes i'm told somewhere between 20 feet between a high tide and a low tide you have industrialization you can see there are all the you name the industry and you will find it is there in the vicinity of this uh, site which has been a, now a heritage site by unesco and you have the human habitat at farm so ganga sagar is really a replication of a life the good things and the not so good things and how do we study the confluence influence conflict of them another interesting thing is in sundarbans you will find you have a very interesting predator and prey cycle so you have the prey you have the predator and between them 
they have a varying le uh, levels of trace elements which are of unique importance. So it's not important that I just study one uh, 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 the specimen from Sundarbans and I would know everything. This particular specimen is intricately related on the top of the chain. I have not shown, of course, the human chain. And so the prey-predator cycle and its important and various level of trace uh, in, uh, they play gives us a very fertile laboratory to study. And what is most important if you see the Sundarbans is you have the high tide and the low tide. So between the plants here, they are intricately related to the sediments that are that are being deposited. So we not only study the sediment, but the uptake of the, the, the uh, whatever is present in the sediment, which comes because of farming, high tide, low tide, the, uh, the industrial waste that is up, but also the uptake by the plants tells us a very important thing. And there's a very interesting relation between, and if you only do the sediment, you have the sand, the clay and the silt. And there is a very interesting uh, coexisting diagram between them, which has uh, been, been, uh, been possible there. And they study the pH of the sediment, the conductivity. And what was most interesting was the organic carbon compound was very low compared to the coastal regions. And this, the other coastal regions on the west part, if you study a, uh, the, 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 the sediment, it has very low organic compound, which talks about the poor absorbability of organics on the negatively charged quartz grain, which is attributed to the flushing activity of the tides. We, and if you see these uh, trace elements have been studied since time immemorial, immemorable till today. And each time the study shows a very interesting feature. So it's not that somebody studies it or somebody says that you are just collecting stamps. No, I'm collecting stamps which are of societal relevance. If now we are finding that there is a decrease in the lead content, and this is a direct outcome of using unleaded petrol in most of the vehicular or the, the motorized vehicles that are used, there is some increase in some of the elements which are actually signifying the waste that is being dumped by the image. We also know that in, in the to a present day world, each organism is exposed to kind of chemicals which we are not in, uh, inherent in our normal metabolic activities and they are referred to as xenobiologists. For example, arsenic, it's a known problem. Arsenic toxicity is a time immemorable problem. And this was one of the experiments that are uh, French from Punjab. So as I said, we have users coming across the length and the breadth of the country. They use pro protons from the uh, IOP facility to excite the material. And, 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 and study them. And we have found out when they subjected rats to arsenic, the metal, this other metal distribution, as I told you, these space elements have a very, a very interesting synergy. And the other metal distribution or the concentration of other metal provided us an uh, idea about what was the altercation at the metabolism level. And if I know what is the altercation, I'm able to stop. So this is what they did was they had the control sample. When they had their sample under study, they found there were certain other elements. It is possible to enhance the presence of certain, if you see this, these elements are very weakly seen. There are tricks in the trade where I can enhance their selection and identify. You can hear, you would put your money and bet your money whether this is a peak or not a peak. But when I show you this, you definitely would buy my saying that yes, there is a peak corresponding to rubidium and zirconium. So these are the uh, instrumentation or the experimental tricks we use to enhance our sensitivity and symmetry. Calcutta has a very well wetlands. There are species present of species which are present at various depths. So if I look at the trace elements in these species, it tells me what is the at what is there a depth dependence on the trace elements? If so, what is that and how do I take care for it? So we actually did the study of fish 
various categories which are present at various depth. And one good thing we came out was most of the accumulation of the trace elements was in the liver, which we don't eat. So all my friends were very much relieved that it is safe to eat the fish. But it told us that the various trace elements had a depth dependence and certain water vegetation effectively pulls them out from the uh, depth. So they, we not only are able to study what is what are the elements that are present, but we try to conjecture on certain solutions. To this. So that's what my friends in the base element people uh, in the base element lab does. Now let's come to an, another related lab, which is the biology. And my friends in biology tell me that they are doing stress biology. And I always keep on telling them that we are always stressed out. So what is the new thing that you're doing? So what they tell me is they try to induce stress either chemically or by radiation. And these stresses try to they try to do a program cell death and then see that what particular messaging was used to bring about the cell death. And if possible, can we elevate that problem or block it? So that's all in a nutshell that my colleagues in biology do. So they usually have a very versatile storage system because that's very important for biology. You need to store your, your cells very specifically. They have the conventional microscope. They have some transplanting setup and a gel doc, which is their workhorse for their DNA mapping. They have centrifuges and ultra cooling facilities, which ensures that the sample is stored properly. They also have a flow cycle. Now, what we the aim of any experiment is that I need to bridge the gap from the bench to the bedside. That's what is the aim of any medically deliverable project. So what I need is I need to have a model which is as a biological model, which is as close to the which is as close to my to the human being and very beautifully other than mice. There's a, a species of fish known as the zebra fish and the zebra fish exhibits a profound resemblance with the human brain as an emotional and behavioral pattern very similar to us. So we can study the neurochemical pathways in humans very effectively using the zebra fish as my laboratory test. So it was found that as I told you in my last few slides arsenic or any toxicity. We always talk of toxicity. So toxicity is some agents which are not supposed to be present and they mostly some of the toxics cause neurotoxicality or toxicity that is the change in the nervous system. Now this can be caused due to environment or due to exposure. So we talk of environmental neurotoxic uh, toxicity in human beings. We talk about ecological toxicity in birds and invertebrates. And I would like to understand this based on my study with this. So that has been done using zebra fish, which has a very good role. And what they did was arsenic is a known neurotoxic. But it, they found out that if you have arsenic and fluoride, arsenic fluoride together, it did show that whenever they subjected a species to only arsenic and a combination of arsenic and chlorine, there was a less deposition of toxin. So it was very interesting to note that arsenic and chlorine have an antagonist kind of a relationship. That is, we are able to minimize the effect of arsenic if I combine it. So this is what is that as I said, this is the beauty of human uh, uh, system is that two elements act differently individually, but when I submit uh, to them uh, together, the, the, the results are totally astonishing and of relevance in the presence. So that's what, as I said, we try to use these new gamma rays, we try to characterize them and study living as well as. So that's what my colleagues in biology do. They use various uh, the gamma radiation. They use pixie as their signature. Now let me come to this thing, and this is something I'm sure I really stand no chance when I talk uh, before the August audience of maybe the, my colleagues from Indore and Bombay. They are the experts in this material science field. But let me then tell you 
what we try to do and how we try to do a bit different. The material science group has, as I said, we always keep on. I, I always have a problem communicating to them that at, we at the nucleus uh, have nuclear physics have always been talking about femto, 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 and they are always been talking about nano, 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 and we never seem to uh, agree which one is more fascinating. So, but anyway, we are maybe each one, each branch of the science has its own view. So what they have been doing is uh, usually they try to study magnetic materials, nanocomposites, uh, composites, so on and so forth. So this without going to the much time to spend my time reading, this slide gives you a picture of what my colleagues in the material science division have been doing. Now let me talk about some of the facilities. Obviously, you would need a very good material preparation. So they have a high energy ball mill and all kinds of furnaces. They have a box, tubular vacuum annealing furnaces, which are used to prepare samples because your study is as good as the sample that you can they have a triac furnace with this. It's a very complicated name. I would not even venture trying to uh, talk about it. A crystal cooler, which they can make crystal. So you have a facility to make the, the samples, and now you need to characterize. So that's all I think which the material science facilities are all centered about. You have a facility, you can make a crystal, but at times it is the human expertise which makes all the I'll, I'll, I'll just show you how it is. So as I said, we have an XID from the Bruckner, which is the workhorse for any material characterization. And my colleagues have been always complaining that there is never dearth of users for this person. I'm sure we do not compete anyway in terms of the specialization, both in terms of human and the experimental facilities at Bingor. But let me tell you what we do different. So this was one of the samples which I think my, my colleague Dr. Rajesh keeps on uh, telling me that this I should be talking about was a sam uh, uh, sample bought for by our colleagues from the Kalpakkam node. They had very thin samples and obviously they would work. So Rajesh who has been making semiconductor detectors has the patience and finesse that he was able to successfully mount the samples without any problem. He came up with, because anything we always cross question that the results that you, uh, uh, you present of, of your experimental scenario. So he tried to come up with several types of mounting arrangements and then he was able to do the measurement at a very small angle. And so, as I said, this is what we tried to do. As I said, we had the finesse and expertise to handle very thin films, do an experiment, and then our colleagues were able. I'm sure Dr. Uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar may talk about this kind of uh, this work. They were able to do the XRD measurement, which was only possible because of a very delicate sample system. Now, uh, I think a month back, my colleagues from the Bombay Center did a fantastically good tool on analysis of the XRD. But now let me tell you something that we like to talk about is something about the XRD spec analysis that nobody tells you. And again, we believe in, as I said, these are in no way a substitute for the advanced analysis program. But most of these programs do not allow you to tinker with them. So if a student wants to learn, that's what we believe. We provide the small nuts and bolts in the understanding of the bigger picture. And that's what makes the picture complete. So if you see that, because I had Rajesh who was always talking about XRD, and we have been dealing with open source resources, I tried to look up the application of Python for XRD. And as I said, it allows you various analysis tools and techniques to understand the underlying thing. So if you come and tell me that I'm going to have a particular material, can I know beforehand what is my spectrum going to be like? And yes, indeed, it is possible. It's just two lines of code in Python, and you give your material, it can be a composite material, it tells you what are the HDL indices, what are the angles at which you should get the line, and what is the index. So you can know beforehand, this is what I expect, because we always believe that if you know what you expect, then definitely you can look for it intelligently. Any measurement 
should not be a picture given to me by my colleague and then i just go and put it in my thesis or in my paper and that's the end of the story so we believe in providing these kind of small things which have their own value addition they are not a substitute to the professional analysis program but these help us understand for example we always talk of white pseudo white fitting profile that the student really know what it actually means this is how you are able to simulate a complex pseudo white peak profile using various combination of gaussian and exponential and that tells you the relevance you see at the low angle where you see an exponential feature essentially coming out due to scattering so these are the you can then simulate actual gaussian voyer lorentzian combine them scale them up and understand the peak profile that you see anything else that you can do yes we as i said we as nuclear physicists always like to see simulation so that's what i asked my colleague rajesh who was working on some fp3 sio2 crystal that how do you know that this is the spectrum you expect and he said i just go and take my spectrum and believe in the jcpdl data that's my bible then we look back and said can we actually simulate the xrd spectrum so these are a very preliminary results that yes if i know my material it is possible again i use ready made tool kits uh, available on the internet i just mix and match them and then it is possible that if you have silicon this is your xrd spectrum that you expect this is one of the compound that rajesh studied for his doctoral thesis so yes in principle we are at a stage where we not only can tell you after the after performing the experiment what your spectrum should look like but we can tell you even before what you should expect and any deviation from that will make you sit up and look at them more carefully so that's a small 2 cents worth of value addition in this big picture we have a mosbos spectrometer which uh, is now a back is going up and 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 running it also has a low temperature facility so you can do an honest to goodness mosbo spectroscope nowadays you don't you cannot it will be blasphemous for me to talk of material science without talking about low temperature high magnetic field facility so we do have a 7 tesla squid magnetometer and magnetization can be measured and they have they tell me they have added a pressure cell so pressure is one more as i said we all believe in exciting or subjecting our system of study to an external stimulus and the response of that tells us what the system is so the more handles or degrees of excitation you have the better is your also have a cryogen free high magnetic field up to 15 tesla tesla magnet so these are the two work horses of our low temperature high magnetic field facility they have a 4k ccr for zero field resistivity and what do they do with this when i ask them this is a slide that which they have provided so this was one of the studies done by our in house student a students are the main work horse of any external facility and they were able to tell me that in mn5 si3 they saw an inverted hysteresis and they had some thermomagnetic reversibility that and this reversibility they have in ensured is not an artifact of their experimental measurement they did all the known tricks in the trade to make sure that this is an actual result you can see so in this system they have established the presence of inverted hysteresis and of the uh, thermomagnetic reversibility and it is the first such the report of this interesting observation my my friend uh, rajiv Uh, has been doing these kind of measurements where he looks for anisotropy and the first question i asked him what is anisotropic and with respect to what and he tried his level best to convince me and i take his word for it there is an anisotropy in the magnetic response when he goes in different field so these two curves being not identical tells him that there is an anisotropy in the magnetic behavior with respect to a field axis and which gives me him all the kind of interesting uh, physics that is trying to look at again he uh, this is the kind of a region where he has observed an anisotropy when he is moving along what he told me i think was the easy axis or something like that or uh, the easy axis for magnetization with respect to that 
there was an anisotropic moment measurement and this is what makes these kind family of of material very interesting he also they also tried to look at something which is known as the tungsten disilicite they tried to make a crystal crystal making is an art they were able to grow a single crystal characterize it and the most beauty that they tell me about this this is extremely large magneto resistance so the value of this magneto large magneto resistance that is the change in the electrical resistance of the material in presence and absence which makes this a very interesting material which i'm sure has a lot of so as i said our material science people are trying to make materials which have some relevance in the field i guess i'll stop here and i have now the last part which i would like to talk about is take you away from research and we have been trying to do something of what we call the innovate and this is again as i said this is part which we do as a part of our outreach program trying to extend whatever we have learned in our research trying to put it to an actual teaching because that's what is very much important and all using open source and people like us who have been doing linux always associate open source with linux but in today's world you have open source for windows and when i use it you can have very innovative experiment and this was we developed because our colleagues told us that they had a specific problem that most of the labs being shut can we come up with small experiments to which the students can do at home which are a part of the ug curriculum and so that lab activities do not suffer and i'll not talk about this but this if you see is a standard experiment to show the use of transistor as a switch now what's the innovation with it i was able to use this setup we all in quantum mechanics i talk about planck's constant this experiment which can be set up by a student in his home was able to give him an experiment to measure planck's constant and also measure it under different conditions and get and feel for the experimental error so we were able to do measurement of planck's constant by a student at his home and do a detailed analysis so what we did was we tried to do use routinely available sources and make the experiment interesting and we use both open source hardware and software for it and as i said the sound card gives me a very versatile data acquisition system i have my experimental setup couple it to the sound card record the data store it in a wave file analyze it using open tool python or octave and you have fascinating experiments most of the labs have a problem with an oscilloscope here i present to you a use of the sound card as a dual channel oscilloscope so this is actually a pi phi timer or stable where i measure the output and the voltage across the capacitor and all you need is this four lines of code either in octave or in python to see this sound card gives me a very good efficient microsecond stopwatch we will always talk of an accelerated motion but have we been able to show our students an accelerated motion no here i present before you an example of an accelerated i have a script which has dark evenly spaced script which has just make it fall between an ir transmitter and a receiver so whenever this portion comes in between them it gets blocked and you have a change of it. so now if you see i have equally spaced plates the time required keeps on decreasing because that's an accelerated motion so if i am able to measure time and displacement since i know all this information a plot of time versus displacement gives you the acceleration to the gravity which you can measure in your home so these are some of the experiments we have been doing to teach the same we went beyond experiment and have actually used python for teaching core courses in mathematical methods quantum mechanics statistical mechanics fourier series is something which gave me a nightmare as a student and we always say that yes 
a square wave is composed of an infinite number of sine waves let the student program it himself and he understands yes it is possible and when you are able to do a program and get a visualization nothing explains better than that and as i was presenting it i was i was very much bothered with this things which i am told is a manifestation of what a phenomena is known as gibbs phenomena in fourier transform as fourier analysis so you show not only the gross features but also the nuances by simple coding which is a four line code so we have developed tools to show do bessel functions uh, harmonics spherical harmonics you name it and that can be taught and visualized to the student we always talk about fermi dirac distribution let the student program it it's a two line code and he sees the chemical potential is that point at which i have 50% occupation potential you have learned it in the textbook he actually does it in sense boltzmann maxwell boltzmann distribution talked about by my colleagues for when they do the neutron thing so again a four line code as the temperature increases it becomes white the student does it sees it he has a feel for it but what fascinated me most was we have always talked about you have seen this this is the standard quantum mechanics problem in griffith we have always by hearted the solution and wrote it down it comes up from a solution a trans solution to this transcendental state it's a four line code which allows you to have a plot find out what are the allowed so this is actually a standard program from uh, uh, problem from griffith which we have programmed and the student actually can generate this plot and see for us we have able to solve the schrodinger equation we have always talk of schrodinger equation we have never solved it i by hearted the solution and vomited it in the examination first time we are able to solve it and then see for see for us so this is what we think and i like to stop now that we are at calcutta center have been trying to use the facilities for research try to help them at teaching and address some of the contemporary problems and advances and equip our colleagues from universities in adapting to the latest technology thank you thank you sir thanks a lot for the enlightening lecture uh, uh, it was really you know eye opening session especially uh, with respect to the the facilities provided by the jcsr calcutta i had also been the privilege to be there yeah you are you are, you are one of us yes sir you sir yes sir yes sir so first question is from my side itself sir uh, yeah. that uh, if we want to serve, especially i would like to uh, because i'm a biomedical researcher you can say uh, we were planning uh, we had the planning and we actually we were having the sample prepared and we wanted to go for the gamma radiation uh, though uh, what i want to we, we were seeing the effect we were trying to see the effect what the uh, gamma radiation had the uh, role in preparing the nanoparticle number 1 and uh, seeing the effect of uh radiation because uh, in biomedicals whenever the things are sterilized uh, many times they are sterilized with the help of gamma radiation okay yeah so we wanted to see the effect of nanoparticle if they have been prepared for therapeutic uses uh, whether the process of sterilization has done some changes or not so in two perspective I, my question is uh, developing nanoparticles and seeing their effect for uh, after the the gamma radiation treatment for sterilization what with the different of doses there well, what i mean to say is that doses different is there facility available to optimize the doses depending on the samples uh, first my question first question is like that only for, for what uh, yeah yeah maybe we should go yeah maybe you will have to talk to dr saha who has this yes. facility but yes, i what i think is most of the their people do is they they have a, a run before they see kind of what are the doses and then they may try to zoom on to their because nobody can tell you before and because radiation damage being such a uh, unknown uh, creature you may expect yes. something at a particular dose but something else may totally happen so i okay. think the best way would be to do it and see it or maybe right. they have some okay. experience yes sir hit and trial will work right. or, or 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 they have some knowledge from some previous users and they may be able to help
Rather, sir, I would be uh, giving in your, uh, you know, presenting in your kind attention that some of our researcher from uh, agriculture and the botany contacted me regarding the uh, oh. seeing for the gamma radiation. Then I uh, recommended then go for the KC uh, Calcutta Center uh, for that gamma radiation effect. They were seeing. I was as soon as about the application, the diverse application that they wanted to see the effect of gamma radiation on the seeding uh, and the you know uh, growing of seeds. On that gamma. I, yeah, I think a couple of studies have already been made by my colleagues from Kalyani University, but I'm sure the biology each specimen is unique. Mm. So if somebody else has studied it, does not mean that you will not get anything new from it, and it will be worth doing. Mm. 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 So that's why this is the beauty that yeah. uh, we can have the you know diverse application out of the yeah. uh, facilities provided. So if this is on the researcher um, uh, you know onus uh, to yeah. utilize. On its own part. Okay, Dr. Sudhendra. Yeah, yeah. I have one question for Dr. Gugle. Uh, uh, you mentioned about the UG and PG projects for the students, so they yeah. want to know how. What is the procedure of getting that invitation, or how to uh, approach you for that uh, kind of uh, uh, project work? Yeah, uh, our only limited that they can write to us. Our only uh, constraint is it has to be a part of their curriculum. It cannot be that they just do out of interest because we believe there is no such interest till it is made mandatory in the curriculum. So mm -hmm. if it is a part of the curriculum, we do take care you of know, all the. I, I, as Dr. Sirigudi has also said, there are no, there is no price for using it. We support them, so everything. It, it as, as I said, but it has to be a part of their curriculum, which has to be evaluated by the university. Then it adds and a dimension of sincerity also. We may not like to agree to it, but that's the ground reality. So if it's a part of the curriculum, we can definitely help. Yeah, yeah. and some users, they want to, to know how to write a proposal, like to get it accepted. And uh, is there any way of providing some guidance on what type of proposals can be right? And how to write a proposal basically? OK, uh, basically what we like to see is they answer three questions. What they want to study, how they want to study and what they expect to learn from it. These three focus points should be there. It cannot be that I want to study uh, hafnium because somebody has studied hufnium. I don't think will uh, that would be so. I think that there has to be a sense of focus, and there is no prescribed thing. We can work back and forth and optimize it based on maybe we find that that study has already been done or something else can be added. So it's a discussion which really ends up in uh, in writing a good proposal. Sure, sure. So uh, I think uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gugre, and uh, I think we had uh, we, we had a very enlightening session today. And uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your nice talk and your time for the talk. And, uh, Dr. Sirigir would like to make a comment. No, 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 it's fine. Okay. Very good. Talk. So we can uh, thank you. Uh, thank, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Dr. Sirigir and Dr. Raipal for giving me this opportunity. Thank, thanks a lot. Pleasure, pleasure, sir. So now we can go to the, we'll take a, a five, ten minutes break and then uh, we can go for the next lecture. Dr. Simanthi, please. Thank you, sir. So we will meet after one you know, of five minutes or maybe ten minutes. Dr. Sujit, what do you say? Uh, I think five, five minutes is okay. We can take it. Five, five minutes. Okay, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, doc uh, Dr. Simanthi, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Uh, as I said, we had developed this and almost we have written it up in the form of some online lecture material. For this, actually using Python to teach mathematical methods, quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics. Can that be ported to your uh, Swayam or these online courses? Obviously, sir. Obviously, rather I was in discussion with uh, Dr. Siruguri also uh, for a couple of months. Uh, we are trying to explore things. What I wanted to go for that, uh, that uh, let's have a you know solid course form of thing uh, so that it can reach to the mass basically what we government is spending a huge amount on these platforms like swayam swayam prabha uh, what i request uh, for because the going for a course may take a little bit of time because it takes uh, for development phase and all that it takes a lot of time around uh, you can say it will take around one year uh, when we will be ending with the uh, complete uh, scenario of the complete lecture package. What I recommend and what I suggest to you people that please contact to the nearest Swayam Prabha channel coordinator and especially 
the Swayam Prabha channel number 15, which is, which is uh, focusing to the engineering uh, and the I think physics is also being taken up by the Swayam Prabha channel 15 and Professor Mangal Sundram is there from IIT Madras. So what you can do, I'll be sharing the email, email ID of uh, Dr. Sundaram. So you can contact him and uh, give you a proposal of preparing the lectures for that. Uh, and I think you might, you must be having Educational Multimedia Research Center, EMRC, uh, most yeah. probably in Jadapur University or nearby. I, I hope so, isn't it? So if it is there they will help you out in recording all that you need not to worry about the you know technical things you just go with your things record the things and they will be telecasted on the swayam prabha channel uh, though the users of swayam prabha channel are not that much good because uh, many people are not having the dth and all that but the beauty is that whatever is telecasted in the swayam prabha uh, is available in the youtube channel of swayam prabha Okay. okay, so right now we have got uh, the opportunity to, you know, to serve the nation in the form of our lecture series and uh, we contributed around uh, 24 hours of lecture during the lockdown. Uh, we did it from our home, our home itself and IIT Madras uh, sponsored that thing and uh, supported that thing and these are available on the YouTube. So by this way, we can have a mass reach and I will be uh, there always to help you out. Uh, so I'll be sending you the contact so we can contact to the Swayam Prabha uh, team. Uh, so these will be uh, available to the mass. So in this way we can do with that. Just you need to go like this only. Go with your slides and just there uh, and nothing special you need not to do, sir. Okay, sir? Oh. Okay, okay. Thank, thank. thank you. Thank you. So see you, sir. See you in ten, uh, five minutes. Okay. Five minutes. Okay. okay. By 11.45 we'll be meeting back. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Rudendra. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Chandrasekhar, I can see your slide. So maybe after five minutes, we will start uh, by 11:45. No problem. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
guess we can start now. Yeah, yeah. One sec. So I am ready, uh, Dr. Rai Prahl. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just, uh, I get... Just signal me, I will start. Sure, sir. Sure, sure, I'll do that. Just a second, sir. Yeah, he's there. Yes, sir. Sir, up there. Dr. Sudhir. Yes, sir. Uh, we can start. We'll start and we will uh, sharing the screen uh, later okay. on. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah. So we are back with the uh, second lecture. So, Dr. Sudhir, over to you. Yeah. Uh, doc, thank you, Dr. Simalti. And uh, it's a pleasure to uh, have Dr. Chandrasekhar with us. As you would have already observed, that we uh, CSR is present on three coasts. So, from west to east. Now we can go to the south of India. And uh, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Chandrasekhar, who is an eminent scientist from IGCAL. And he's also in charge, scientist in charge for the Kalpakam node. He's looking after the Kalpakam node also. So I invite Dr. Chandrasekhar to give his lecture and, and tell us about the facilities and research, research activities which are which can be carried out or which are be carried out at the Kalpakam node. Uh, over to you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. You can start, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, pardon, sir. Pardon, sir. Uh, if you want to open up your camera, you can also open up your camera. We will go with your uh, camera as well as the slide. No issue. You just open up your camera, then I'll take. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hold on. Hold on. And uh, you uh, put your slide on full screen. Yeah. Uh, might be you might not be seeing the the other people at the time, but uh, we'll be seeing you. Okay, sir. Uh, I'm selecting your slide. Uh, hold on. Just a minute. Oh, what happened? No. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just yes, going yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, now I think uh, you will be live. Yes, sir. You are live now with the slides. Welcome, Dr. Chandrasekhar. Uh, thank you, uh, Samalti ji, Professor Samalti. And uh, first of all, I would like to really thank the organizers of this awareness uh, workshop, the uh, professors from the Garhwal University, the vice chancellor, and uh, our esteemed uh, uh, director, Dr. Siriguri, uh, Dr. Rai Prahl, all these people for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk about uh, the Kalpakam node, which is a very unique center in itself. And uh, I'll be talking about uh, the facilities which are offered to the universities and our own in-house research. So in the first slide, I'm giving you a few photographs. As you can see on the uh, right side at top, it gives the photograph of the Kalpakam Node Center, uh, the entrance and so on. This is the main building of the Kalpakam Node Center, which is situated inside Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research, Kalpakam. And on the left side, you can see the uh, view from the top of the entire center, which consists of various uh, wings the physical science wing, the chemical science wing, and the engineering science wing. And you can also have a glimpse of the sea as the center is on the seashore. You can have the glimpse of the uh, sea. And this is really contrast to uh, the Garhwal University, which is situated on a valley between the mountains. So here you have a view uh, of the Kalpakam center, 
which is just beside the seashore. And uh, below that, we have also uh, we had a tree planting session. We uh, are very much uh, uh, aware, conscious about the ecosystem. And uh, this one, there is also a legal uh, binding on us that we have to plant more trees inside the center as we start building more buildings. I mean, for for scientific use. So here we have uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Shamima Hussain uh, planting a tree, and her student is standing nearby. I am also standing. So this gives uh, the one of the important differences between the Kalpakam node and other centers about which the participants are being are hearing the past two days is that uh, the Kalpakam node consists is a very small uh, unit and it is also a very new uh, center. It is uh, only uh, 10 years old and also we have only these four scientists uh, right now. All of them are condensed matter physicists or material scientists and uh, we have Dr. Gopal M. Balerao, Dr. Sujay Chakravarti, Dr. Shamima Hussain, and Dr. K. Saramanan, who has joined us only this year. So let me go over to uh, the first few slides will be of general uh, nature, where I talk about uh, the location of the center and uh, what are the other interesting aspects of the center. Then I will go over to the technical part of it. So here, uh, you can see the as others have also shown, I am also showing the uh, UGCDA consortium website where uh, here you have the research facilities listed at Indore Center, Mumbai Center, Calcutta Center and the Kalpakam node. And as you can see from the name itself that we are associated with the uh, Department of Atomic Energy Center and at Indore Center we are associated with the reactor research, sorry, uh, the Raja Ramana Center for Advanced Technology. At the Mumbai Center, we are associated with the Baba Atomic Research Center. At Calcutta Center, we are associated with the VECC Variable Energy Cyclotron Source. And at Kalpakam Node, we are associated with Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research. So uh, the uh, and here we have provided the detailed address, the phone numbers, and the uh, contact email ID in case you want to. You need to contact us. This is for the all the participants. And this Kalpakam node was created uh, only in 2007. The uh, MOU was signed between IGCAR and UGCDSASR. And uh, from then on, we have been having very active collaboration with uh, IGCAR. UGC scientists have very active collaboration with uh, IGCAR. And this uh, formally, this node came into existence in 2011 only. So let me uh, give uh, briefly, uh, the main mission of Indira Gandhi Center for Autonomy Research. It is important to understand the mission in order to uh, understand the programs of the node also. So here, I am just providing you some pictures of the uh, pictures from the Indira Gandhi Center for Autonomy Research, where this is, these are the pictures of the fast period uh, research reactor. So here, you can, as you can read, the main mission of uh, the Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research is establishment of technology of sodium cooled fast breeder reactors. So as you can, uh, as you know that the Department of Atomic Energy, the main goal is to produce nuclear power and all the subsidiary uh, the research is also associated, uh, research is also going on associated fuel cycle facilities in the country. So here you see the mission includes the development and applications of new and improved materials. That's where the material scientists, physicists, chemists, engineers, they contribute techniques, equipment and systems for fast breeder reactor. As you can see, this is the main mission and motto of Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research and it is situated uh, near uh, Chennai, some 60 kilometers from uh, Chennai and it is on the seashore. And uh, one of the important uh, uh, thing which has evolved from the fast breeder test reactor is the prototype fast breeder reactor, which is under advanced uh, stage of commissioning. It should be commissioned uh, anytime now. And this fast breeder prototype reactor will contribute 50 megawatt of megawatt of electric power to the Tamil Nadu grid. And this is uh, being built by a company called Bharatiya Navikiya Vidyut Nigam. So as you can see, the, Kalp the Kalpakam node of UGCCSR is located deep inside something called a nuclear park. This nuclear park consists of several types of nuclear reactors producing power and 
several uh, parts of the nuclear fuel cycle, nuclear fuel fabrication, nuclear fuel usage, and nuclear fuel reprocessing. So this is right in the center of our very advanced technological uh, center of our country, and that provides opportunity for our scientists to innovate on materials as well as technology. So here I have just uh, wanted to provide the glimpse of nature uh, in our Kalpakum node. Not only that we are interested in doing science, but we are also very conscious about maintaining the nature uh, and uh, leave it to itself. So like for example, you see here, this particular motto I have taken from the Garhwal University's uh, uh, symbol, uh, Jiva Jyotira Jyotirashi Mahi, which uh, means may we receive light while we are still alive. It is a very important uh, saying from uh, Vedic uh, uh, saying. And then uh, this uh, says that when we live, uh, let the knowledge uh, come to us. So the knowledge should come to us from nature and therefore the nature has to be preserved uh, rightly. So in Kalpakam uh, Node and Kalpakam as the townships as well as the centers, we take uh, a lot of care in preserving it. This shows few pictures which our uh, very enthusiastic photographer Prem has taken and it is also given in our website, Kalpakam IGCR website. If you go, you can have a look at all these pictures. These are all uh, birds and this shows the seashore and this shows the bridge which we need to cross when we go from IGCR towards the UGC DACSR Kalpakam Node Center. And uh, when we go, when our scientists and myself, we go every day, we cross this bridge and we really have a very good uh, view of this bridge and the backwaters and several birds, migratory birds, which come around here during the various uh, uh, seasons of the uh, year. So uh, let me go to the, the other important part, which is the manpower at uh, UGC DACSR. We, we have only four faculty and uh, all four of them are uh, condensed matter physicists, material scientists, and uh, they are here. I can just name them. This is Dr. Bale Rao, and this is Dr. Shamima Hussain. This is Dr. Sujay Chakravarti, and it is, this is Dr. Sarvana. And we have seven students. And uh, it is very important to say here that none of them are from Tamil Nadu. Actually, uh, Abhishek, he is from Himachal Pradesh and many others are from uh, Haryana. He is Mandeep is from Haryana and uh, uh, Somesh as well as uh, the, uh, this, uh, Thakur as well as our Dina, uh, Balram and Dina, they are from Uttar Pradesh and Srinivas is from uh, Andhra Pradesh and our Siddharth is from uh, West Bengal. So we have a range of people from all over the country. And they very nicely adjusted to Kalpakum Node, and I, I give this as a signature, as a sign that uh, people, PhD students from uh, Uttarakhand, are welcome to uh, Kalpakum Node. We have wonderful facilities available here. We provide uh, for PhD students separate accommodation for them inside it, our township itself with very good hospital facilities, which is uh, DA hospital facility itself is extended to these students. And then they, they have also, we have made arrangement for transport facility from the township to the center and back. So this way we are also providing in the, uh, uh, the center, the Wi-Fi connection and connection to all the literature sources, uh, which is available to IGCR. IGCR library itself, which is one of the biggest and one of the best in South India is available for them. So this way we have enabled uh, the students to do, uh, to come out uh, with their best and uh, I can say with proudly that uh, five of these students have already reached fourth year and they have performed extremely well and uh, they have got several publications already. They have completed the minimum requirements of the UGC and I am sure that within uh, a year or so, within uh, maybe uh, at the next year end, they should be able to complete their, uh, submit their PhD thesis and look for better opportunities in terms of postdoc or job outside. So this is the situation of the students as well as the faculty of our center. Now let me go over to individual uh, expertise. Uh, like Bale Rao is expert in nanomaterials and also microscopy uh, and crystal growth. So uh, when you look at these facilities later, when I show these slides, you will be able to connect uh, well. And then his students, uh, Srinivas Reddy and Somesh Chandra here, and they have their own interests. Uh, Srinivas Reddy has already got several publications. He has also used widely our RRCAT synchrotron facilities. 
and uh, he is uh, very enthusiastically looking forward for submission of his thesis. So, Mr. Chandra, who is in his second year, already latched on to a very nice problem, and uh, he will be completing it as per the uh, period given by UGC. And here we have a new entrant to uh, UGC, Dr. K. Saravanan, uh, scientist D, and he is an expert. He has a wonderful experience in accelerator-based research. As I will be telling you later, a 200 kev accelerator has been opened for users uh, in march onwards unfortunately because of the situation in our country uh, we were unable to hold any workshop or anything like that however this facility is now open for users i will be talking about its specifications and the utilization how it can be used later during this talk and uh, he is now working very hard to establish all the facilities and already several experiments are going on uh, using this accelerator, 200 kV accelerator. This is Dr. Shamima Hussain, a very senior scientist and who uh, is right now interested in synthesis and characterization of uh, these uh, polymers and transition uh, metal chalcogenides uh, and so on. And uh, she is studying optical transport and pro these properties of these microstructures. And basically, they are interested in better sensor materials, physiologic sensors and so on. And we have Siddharth Dham. Abhishek Tagore and uh, Mandeep is actually a DST fellow who is working on thin films of polymer polymer composites and Siddharth Dham and Abhishek Tagore are extremely uh, uh, doing well and uh, they are in their fourth year of PhD. Hopefully they will complete another year. Here we have uh, Dr. Sujay Chakravarti, an expert in magnetism and uh, particularly he has been studying carbon and dilute magnetic semiconductors and is also in his PhD was in atomic diffusion and therefore is continuing to be interested in atomic diffusion in nanomaterials and we have Dinanath and Baldram Thakur. They are all now uh, both they are doing uh, extremely well in ex experiments as well as they are into now computation as we have our own uh, computers and then codes procured for them and they are into computation also and already they are writing papers on combination of experiments as well as computation. He is, Dinanath is uh, now uh, working on aluminum nitrate, the magnetic and transport properties of aluminum nitrate and uh, Balram is uh, investigating the very exciting uh, origin of uh, magnetism in carbon and already he has got a very high impact publication in carbon. So uh, let me uh, come over to our uh, this uh, collaborative research schemes. The collaborative research schemes, which are actually the most important aspect of UGC DACSR, uh, it has uh, suffered a little bit due, due to this uh, situation in the, due to COVID-19. However, uh, this is active collaborations are going on. As you can see, these are the total number of CRS sanctions and this total is 113 and right now around uh, maybe 20 or 19 to 20 uh, CRS projects are continuing, but uh, we have not been able to start new projects, which hopefully will improve uh, within a few months. And this gives the bar chart, the right side bar chart gives the PhDs from uh, the CRS uh, schemes, which is very impressive. And that's where I had talked to our director saying that uh, uh, in the southern region of our country, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka and uh, uh, Andhra, uh, I think we will emerge as an important center, Kalpakam node will emerge as an important center which will contribute towards the PhDs emerging from this region. Because we are having uh, collaboration with the various uh, state universities at, as well as central universities which are situated in this region. I will also talk about uh, other aspects of programs we have for these uh, uh, colleges and universities in uh, district of Tamil Nadu. So let me now uh, go to the main aspect of uh, uh, this center. As you see, this center is very small and uh, it is focused on material science. So for focusing on material science, we need uh, to uh, concentrate on three aspects. One is that we should uh, talk about uh, so material synthesis. We should have the facilities for synthesis in various forms, bulk as well as thin films. And also we should have uh, the uh, techniques for characterizing these materials and also go for measurement. But you should also take into consideration we are uh, surviving uh, as a complementary or a synergy with materials science group in IGCAR, which has which is an ex excellent uh, materials characterization facilities as well as metallurgy group, which has mechanical as well as thermodynamic properties uh, instruments 
and we are also having collaboration with the chemistry group of Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research, which all these three combined together, we all these techniques are open to our students and faculty to conduct research and even for our CRS collaborators who come down for measurements. So these synthesis facilities are uh, which I am going to show are in our UGC building itself. I am not covering the other part which is there in uh, outside the building. So the first one I want to cover is the, uh, the infrared optical float zone furnace system, which has uh, contributed wonderfully. I mean, several uh, rare earth oxide crystals have been grown, which I will be showing photographs of them, and then it has led to uh, several publications. And uh, specific, the specifications and features of this uh, optical float zone furnace system is that it can go to 1,800 degrees centigrade, so high melting point oxide materials a single crystals of that can be grown. I am uh, right. This facility also exists, I think, in the indoor center right now, uh, where we have four halogen lamps and there are elliptical mirrors to focus and we can have different kinds of atmospheres and pulling speeds. And uh, the polycrystalline feed rods have to be prepared while growing the single crystals. So I will be showing while I show, show the results. I will be showing several crystals which have been grown uh, with this facility and also publications. The, uh, we have uh, an extensive facility for growing single crystals. The first one which I showed you was the uh, infrared uh, crystal growth floating zone method. And we also have Bridgman and Chakrovsky uh, pullers. This Chakrovsky puller uh, specifically has been uh, designed and grown for lithium niobate uh, single crystals. So you can see here this is uh, designed with local expertise. This has been designed with automatic diameter control. So a lot of uh, technical uh, inputs uh, uh, have been given to this company and uh, with working with the company, uh, we have been able to do this one. This, if you look at this cost, this is actually an import substitute and this costs very less as compared to the uh, imported material, imported equipment. And uh, this has this molybdenum disilicide heating element and uh, this particular, uh, this is actually not a picture which has been grown, but similar crystals can be grown using this uh, uh, equipment and already we have collaborations with the various groups in uh, IGCER who need these crystals for their sensors. Here I would like to grow, I would like to show another development uh, uh, equipment which we have done for growing um, single crystals for radiation detection. So this is called uh, traveling heated method. This entirely has been uh, done uh, in-house uh, here in uh, UGC. You look at this uh, thing like here, based on the temperature gradient which is required, the entire traveling heater method principle is developed. This is the kind of typical heater which goes inside the uh, furnace and this shows the entire furnace where you have the uh, tra translation, the top translation, the bottom translation, the rotation as well as the entire heater uh, is uh, translated into the uh, vertically for growing the crystals with this kind of temperature gradient. And there is a translation rate as you see the 1 not 3, 1 to 3 mm per day. So usually these crystals you know they go over a period of uh, uh, say 3 months and then 24 by 7 this has to be maintained with a lot of UPS uh, standbys and so on. And finally you get the beautiful crystals which can be used further for uh, detectors applications. Sir. So this shows a typical profile where uh, we have to study these uh, furnaces and then set up these uh, uh, profiles carefully in order to go in order to grow these crystals. So at uh, the crystal growth equipments available at uh, UGC DACS or Kalpakam node are the following. The optical float zone which I showed you and uh, Shakurovsky crystal growth with a typical equipment I showed you for growing lithium niobate crystal and we also have Bridgman uh, crystal growing furnace, a traveling heater method, which is modification of this. And we also have high temperature solution growth equipment and various other uh, things which are needed for processing the crystal. Like we need to mix uh, the precursor uh, uh, elements and also we need to seal them in uh, vacuum or, or the inert gas environment. And also we need to, uh, after the crystals are grown, we need to cut them and polish them. All these uh, facilities are now available at Kalpakam node. Now, in order to uh, process certain uh, 
uh, materials, we need to increase the density of the powder, reduce the porosity and increase the density in order to uh, I mean, have the genuine measurement of the genuine pro mechanical properties and of the material. So this uh, has been procured and then this is available uh, for use, uh, this hot isostatic press which is capable of this kind of pressure, 30,000 PSI and uh, 2,200 degrees centigrade. And uh, this is fully automated and, and this is simple and economical. And uh, several experiments have been done for the structural material of structural nuclear material. As you see, the nuclear industry uh, talks about the different kinds of materials. One is the fuel material. Fuel material consists of the agrinade oxides and uh, metal and the structural material consists of different forms of stainless steel. So the powder metallurgy of the stainless steel is also plays an important part. And here, uh, metallurgists uh, use this uh, hot isostatic press to a great deal. So this is another uh, component of the synthesis, uh, material synthesis uh, uh, facilities. This is a high energy ball mill which uh, again, it has all these uh, things. This is for uh, large volume. Usually uh, basic research, uh, they, they go for very small volume. However, this has large volume. And for, uh, as I told you that for material synthesis, we need to uh, go for uh, uh, techniques which are for uh, having uh, synthesis in bulk and also techniques which can synthesize thin films. Uh, so we have this e evaporation uh, system for depositing films of high purity material. And uh, this has been widely used by our users. And uh, another thing which I want to point out is many of these facilities, they certainly go bad sometimes, but all the efforts are taken to keep them up maximum time. So whenever certain user wants certain facility, he has to find out whether it is working or not at that point of time. So that is very important. So this is the DC RF magnet transferring system where uh, it has been used. Even our uh, uh, Dr. Sujay Chakrati has used this uh, magnet transferring film system for depositing aluminum nitride uh, uh, thin films. And he is, uh, his student Dinanath has conducted a lot of uh, work using that this thing. This has a specification, the following specification. This is that there is a consistent of a two RF sources with the 600 watt and uh, this uh, 13.56 megahertz R of power supply, and uh, this can uh, go for argon, nitrogen, and oxygen atmosphere. And uh, this also has facility for substrate rotation and substrate heating during deposition up to 800 degrees. And uh, this base vacuum is better than 20 power minus 1 millibar, and uh, this is also available for users. Then we uh, even our uh, Calcutta Center showed us that uh, this arc melting. Uh, facilities available. My, my own personal opinion is arc melting is a wonderful technique for preparing intermetallics because uh, if you want to prepare intermetallics, you need very uh, temperature as well as it has to be done quickly in order to avoid oxidation. So arc melting is a wonderful technique. So here we use synthesis uh, using arc melting technique for amorphous alloys, ingots, and then this facility for spin casting, uh, ribbons can be prepared. Even I think metallic glasses can be prepared. Uh, and uh, by uh, after preparing these uh, alloys, uh, the either compounds or alloys, they have to anneal it and then characterize it for characterizes for the homo homogeneity as well as single phase. Uh, uh, this one uh, by X-ray and so on. So this is a very wonderful facility, and many users are using it for preparing intermetallics. So now I come to a very new facility which uh, has been established in uh, Kalpakam Node, a 200 kV accelerator. Uh, this has been uh, commissioned and now we got the AERB clearance and formally it was opened by our director, uh, Dr. A.K. Badri and the ex-director of UGCDCS, uh, Dr. A.K. Sinha uh, on 11th March 2020 and uh, it was open for all the uses. Unfortunately, as I told you that uh, soon after uh, that we had the situation of COVID-19, so uh, it could not be used. Uh, but now we have started using it and then uh, these are the various ions available uh, now, we have to go for other precursors. If the users want, we have to go for other precursors. Right now, these are available and users can plan their experiments. So what can be done with this accelerator uh, is what I am going to talk about it now. Uh, Dr. K. Saravanan has given me, uh, made these nice slides on uh, the synthesis and modification of materials using high energy 
ions. So this is the kind of voltages we have. Terminal voltage is 200 kV, and these are the uh, for this kind of ions, the beam current is few microamps, and the substrate temperature can be up to 850 degree Kelvin. So first uh, we talk about this ion beam induced modification. So alloying of thin films is a wonderful uh, facility. So all these are uh, either modification or synthesis. So later you need to characterize what has happened to your film or bulk. So alloying of thin films where when you mix uh, two ions and then uh, you can get this kind of uh, alloy and then one can later characterize this. This ion beam sputtering is where you can also get these nano patterns and ripples on the surface. Uh, this shows nice uh, ripples which has been created due to this kind of ion beam sputtering and uh, various angles are also possible where the uh, case Ramanan now he has made these holders for getting various angles one can uh, do the ion beam sputtering also. So these are the various other uh, applications of the ion beam induced modification. Then you talk about uh, this uh, here it's shown gold nano clusters in silicon. So one can go for these embedded nano clusters and study the feature. So here, for example, here it is shown on silicon carbide uh, nano particles in silicon by hot ion implantation. So various possibilities exist. So I request all the users, the participants to take make note of this and then uh, apply to us for using this uh, 200 kV accelerator at Kalpa Kamlaud. So as a part of the short term collaboration, we are providing the accommodation as well as the travel for uh, the students who can come and then uh, do this. They can write to me or uh, Dr. K. Saravanan for doing all these experiments. So this is one experiment which uh, Saravanan has done. He has got a publication also, although the citation is not available here. This he has done for reduction of graphene oxide, which is alternative to other conventional methods. And this he says it's efficient as well as fast and eco-friendly. So this is very important. So this is part of his work which he has done and uh, this is also published. So something which he would like to, I think, uh, latch on to, he has provided here on dilute magnetic semiconductors. He would like to start his work. And uh, so in this case, we have the zinc oxide, zinc oxide uh, uh, semiconductors where we say that by doping the magnetic impurities, uh, you create point effect. Basically, when you radiate this material, defects are going to be generated. So what these defects are going to do is what you, are, you study. And uh, if the properties are improved, you get exotic properties. All these things are to be studied. So that's what he plans to do in uh, zinc oxide. That's what he has given as a slide here. But uh, we have to this research based on the 200 kV, in-house research based on the 200 kV accelerator will be taken up by Saravanan. And I hope that in few months, it will be uh, maybe another six months. This will be uh, launched very beautifully. So in future, he has written that for the in-house research, he wants to take up uh, these two things and in to electrical characterization during right now. We have only the sample holders and you can irradiate the sample with uh, these uh, ions. However, if he wants to set up in situ electrical characterization, which will be very useful. And he also wants to set up this nuclear reaction analysis facility in uh, in situ. Uh, for in, in the accelerator. So this is kind of futuristic program. Maybe we will another a couple of years we will uh, take for launching onto these facilities. Now I come over to some of the uh, like this uh, material synthesis uh, facilities I have uh, given you. However, we have several other facilities available in material science group, Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research, and they can also be used in case a student wants to use them. They can find out uh, from the IGCR website and write to us and we will facilitate them, enable them to use those facilities also. And uh, particularly the center director, IGCR center director has told me that uh, they should be available for all these students. Therefore, these facilities are there. However, other facilities are also available, which are available in material science group in IGCR. So some of the characterization uh, tools are also like that. So we have got these complementary tools, some of them same as whatever is available MSG. However, they are complementary. Like for example, I will take up uh, one by one. This uh, transmission electron microscope is uh, available. Several transmission electron microscopes are available in IGCR as well as uh, in UGC. And uh, one can find out the status of this uh, uh, transmission. A lot of efforts are being efforts are required 
for the keep up of these machines and uh, so and also they give uh, they have worked very well and given lot of output and right now at least one of them is on uh, which i will show you later this particular transmission electron microscope is right now uh, we are doing certain repair work and it will be on in um, hopefully in couple of months so one can write to us for the use of transmission electron microscopy if required we will enable using the facilities either in ugc or ig uh, ugc or uh, igcar this of course is very very working very well a scanning probe microscope afm which is now available and then people are using it right and left our scientists as well as the students who are short term users as well as the crs users uh, this one is uh, again uh, fib uh, scm which has been widely used i will be showing very nice results using this uh, uh, particular uh, microscope the uh, nano patterning kind of uh, work which uh, our colleagues have done and i will showing you the results later just uh, now i am listing down all the facilities which are available in our uh, center so this is uh, fab scm and this is another one and this is an important facility a uh, kind of complementary facility as uh, uh, as compared to msg because there we have powder xrds high temperature powder xrd also this is this is for specifically made for ga xrd because now a lot of people are going in for uh, research using thin films uh, polymers as well as other uh, inorganic substances therefore this ga xrd was preferred and uh, this is uh, that broker ga xrd is available and lot of uh, work is uh, going on with this one then we have two specific equipments one is this uh, mr system 15 Tesla MR system and then one speed magnetometer. Both of them are used for low temperature research. And our collaborators in IIT Core as well as our own uh, UGC science faculty, Dr. Sujay Chakravarti, they use them extensively, and uh, this has given us wonderful output and results. Now we are in the process of maybe uh, maybe we will be going in for a physical property measurement system in the future, near future. this is what the squid vsm uh, magnetic property measurement system which i talked about uh, and this one along with the other one mr measurement system is our really great workhorse for doing low temperature research and uh, i will be showing some of the results when i show the uh, all the results together at the time i will show some of the results from this equipment some of the uh, engineering side like we have stress strain micro probe which is available and if the engineers are uh, interested in uh, using these uh, uh, facilities they are welcome to write to us and we will be made available to them like spawn uh, small punch creep uh, testing system creep testing and stress strain micro probe these are all on the engineering wing of the uh, ugc da csr kalpa kam now and we have this uh, micro raman system with uh, temperature variation which is useful for studying the vibrational property of uh, solids because our uh, scientists are mostly material scientists and condensed matter researchers so mostly this is used widely for characterization of their materials and these are the specifications uh, we have this 540 nanometer and 785 nanometer uh, lasers and uh, these are the kind of facilities temperatures and facilities available uh, for use with this equipment we also have a wonderful uh, x ray photo electron spectroscopy right now we are uh, buying some more spares and uh, making it more versatile this equipment has been very useful in uh, this uh, determining the oxidation states and uh, it has uh, given uh, I mean lot of publications but right now it is uh, being renovated and uh, some spares we need to buy and make it operational but however if someone wants to do xps uh, we can always uh, make our facility at igc are available for them to do it we also have a, a nuclear magnetic resonance system and uh, this our chemists at uh, igcar as well as uh, some of the people who are interested they are using this system and the specifications are given here a 400 megahertz nmr spectrometer and this has a high resolution 9.4 tesla magnet this is a kind of frequency ranges available and one can probe liquid as well as solid state uh, here in this particular system 
and uh, I mean, we, our uh, uh, Dr. Amanendra, who was the earlier scientist in charge, has a wonderful uh, uh, vision to install a server with uh, for computing. And uh, this has been there with uh, Material Studio code, and uh, where several codes are available in the center. And uh, already our researchers have been using it widely, and uh, this can also be used. And one can uh, apply for using this uh, and finding out what are the codes available, and if they want, they can use this system for doing their computations. Already our uh, students are into computation. So uh, now I come to, I told you briefly about some of the material synthesis uh, uh, facilities which we have and some of the characterization tools which we have and measurement tools, characterization as well as basic characterization as well as measurement tools which we have. And we also, our faculty are also widely using the facilities which are available at IGC because it is very just a, a few kilometers away and we have wonderful uh, uh, collaborations with them and all those facilities are also available for us. So here I will show you some representative results from uh, some of these uh, facilities. So I start with uh, crystal growth. So these are some of the oxide crystals uh, grown by this optical float floating zone uh, technique. So as you can see, uh, many of these rare earth transition metal oxides uh, are there and uh, you can look at the sizes also. So quite big uh, crystals are grown and uh, several publications have come out of uh, these uh, crystals. We have wide collaboration with Anna University as well as the Shivnadar College where uh, we have the nice crystal growing facilities available. So we have this collaboration. Several students have benefited from these uh, uh, crystals. And uh, we also have collaborations for growing crystals, which are a specific application for piezoelectric application, for radiation detector application, and sensor application, and so on. So again, uh, again shows the as grown and this uh, gallium oxide single crystals, which are oriented and polished. As I told you, we need to not only the crystals have to be grown, they have to be cut and oriented and then polished like this. And finally, you need to, of course, all these facilities, uh, some of the facilities we depend on outside agencies. However, this uh, crystal can be grown, cut and polished here in UGC DAA CSR. So this shows yeah, yttrium titanium oxide single crystals and uh, how uh, this is used in uh, fuel cells. In this case, the, for the first time, the hardness, the elastic, the bulk modulus of these crystals have been measured and uh, this is reported in this particular journal and uh, as you can see these are very wonderful crystals which are uh, got wide uh, applications this shows the uh, uh, the single crystal of uh, yttrium aluminum oxide where particularly it is as you see, we are in uh, Department of Atomic Energy, so we always look for uh, gamma detectors and also dosimeters application. So there is a group, uh, health physics group in our uh, center, IGCAR, which uh, works basically on preparing, looking for various materials for dosimetry. So this has been studied for uh, dosimetry and uh, beta radiation. And you see the thing, how nicely the linear response is there for this uh, various doses which is actually very wonderful result. This shows the lava pattern of the crystal. And this has been published in Optical Materials 2020. And for this, some of these uh, various uh, single crystal applications, we have collaborations with uh, uh, Raja Ramana uh, Center, uh, Center for Advanced Technology, uh, Indoor, for some of these applications, measurement as well as application. This shows the uh, single crystal of uh, dysprosium uh, manganese oxide and uh, you see the, uh, the single crystal pattern and uh, the size of the single crystal which is grown and some of these uh, measurements and uh, this shows particularly uh, like very good uh, transition, spin glare transition around uh, reordering temperature of around 7K and uh, these authors say that this is reported for the first time and this is published in uh, Journal of Physical Chemistry 2019 and uh, this uh, finally they were able to construct the uh, temperature concentration phase diagram uh, for this uh, single crystal. So this also I think that it's a collaboration between uh, Raja Ramana Center. 
and this uh, shows the single crystal of uh, uh, gadolinium titanium oxide again uh, where these measurements uv vis nir measurements have been done look at these uh, crystals how nicely uh, they have been uh, uh, grown and with, the, with this kind of atmosphere using the uh, technique floating zone technique and then uh, this shows the rocking curve analysis of the single crystal with various ambiences so so the argon ambiens uh, grown crystal uh, regains its oxygen shock humidity the oxygen shock humidity is very important for its property so uh, but for argon grown crystal there is no transparency but when it annealed that transparency nature changes to 80% so here uh, still it's not uh, published further studies are under progress So here I would like to now switch over to the FIB SEM uh, facility where excellent nano patterning has been done. So I thank uh, Dr. Pandian to share his uh, slides, some of his slides. So I'll just show you, I'm not an expert in this, but I'll just share with you some of the things which can be done using this uh, technique. Like for example here, ion milling has been done. Ion milling, insulated deposition, metal deposition, lamella preparation and so on and further look at this uh, single zinc oxide nanowire sensor which has been bit put between these platinum strips for measurement and the light sensing with the single nanowire has been measured here is shown here voltage versus time and you can see how when the light is on it goes it shows the voltage and here uh, there is a single gallium nitride nanowire here single gallium nitride nanowire and the IV measurement of the single gallium nitride nanowire has been done. So this, uh, this is the reference. And here they have made a single nanorod based FET structure itself. And uh, uh, these are the wonderful uh, things which can which are possible with the FAB SEM based nano fabrication uh, techniques. And I just wanted to show you one more. Uh, these are the closely packed platinum nano pillar uh, pattern by electron beam induced deposition. These are all wonderful patterns which are formed. This is a 3D pattern. And uh, these are the possibilities which are there. And further studies are going on for uh, measurement. So this shows again the nano patterning uh, things where these uh, gallimated nano drops on the uh, template. A template has been platinum nano nano dot template on which gallium nitride nano rods are prepared. So the nano rods are glowing on these uh, uh, gallium nitride, uh, the platinum nano rods. So the gallium nitride nucleates only on these uh, platinum nano rods deposited by FABACM on silicon wafer. So this shows the close up of the uh, nano rods of gallium nitride. Pardon these sir, are the platinum sir. nano rods. Pardon sir, Chansikha sir. Uh, I'm, yes. just, I'm just shifting my network because my, uh, the current has gone. So just a few minutes, in case in any, issue, any issue is there, the Dr. Sudhir uh, will uh, take, okay? Just hold on. Okay. Uh, Should I stop it now? No, 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 no just hold on. Just uh, a sir, five minutes. Five minutes. Uh, okay, okay, you can you can carry, as a producer, Dr. Sudhir, you are there, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so here. Yeah, I, 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 thing, uh, because the light has gone, so because my Wi-Fi will go, okay? Okay, electricity has gone. Yeah, okay, but, but you can continue, sir, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, this shows these uh, possibilities with this uh, FAB SEM. If only you need to have imagination and uh, uh, several things can be done using this facility. So again, nano stamping and nano printing, you see how by a deposition as well as by etching, uh, where this world map has been created and this is the emblem of uh, the emblem has been. Is it okay? Is it okay? Now we are back, sir. We are back. Yeah. I'm back now. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can continue, sir. It's fine. Okay. So uh, here I just conclude the possibilities with this FAB SEM and uh, this has a lot of uh, possibilities and then our scientists are working on it and I just showed you some of the uh, few examples from whatever is possible using this system. Now I go to uh, uh, Dr. Sujay Chakravarti and his team and uh, some of the in-house research, only typical, some of the typical results which he has got uh, from his in-house research as well as collaborative research, which I will be doing for other members of Kalpa Kamnod. So here, this is actually a collaborative work which uh, Sujay, Dr. Sujay Chakravarti has uh, uh, done with uh, Dr. Kadirvel, our assistant professor in uh, PhD College of Technology, Coimbatore, where uh, these people have synthesized zinc oxide nanoparticles 
and fabricated this photodiode. And our contribution has been to do uh, GEXRD uh, on this. And then uh, now this uh, particular thing, uh, they synthesized and then they are now the manuscript, uh, they are writing, I think they are uh, writing the manuscript on this particular thing. And we have contributed towards X-ray characterization of this uh, zinc, uh, uh, zinc oxide. This shows the SEM patterns of the zinc oxide. And uh, this is another collaborative work wherein the, our uh, Sujay Chakravarti is involved. And this is with the Department of uh, Physics, Pondicherry University, which is adjacent to Kalpakam, uh, 150 kilometers from Kalpakam. And wherein these people have uh, grown this uh, <coughs> uh, lithium silicon oxide. I think this has interest from the uh, ion ionic or solid electrolyte uh, uh, application point of view and then here we have done some of these uh, SEM and uh, other results. So this is uh, the second one wherein we have collaborated for uh, SEM and here we have this uh, fullerene thin film which these uh, authors uh, uh, Dr. Neeraj Shukla from NIT Patna they have irradiated it and we have done the MR measurement on these uh, systems. So here, uh, if you see that uh, they have found that induced magnetic moments uh, to be of the order of 31.6 uh, micro bores uh, per ion for one MeV proton microbeam irradiation. And uh, this, uh, this uh, these are the kind of results they have obtained. Again, this is under uh, review. This particular manuscript is under review. This uh, GXRD also done by uh, UGC at uh, Kalpakam. This shows another uh, collaborative work. Uh, this has been done for NIT Roorkela, Dr. Surya Prakash, Surya Narayan Dash. Uh, and here uh, the, we have worked on lanthanum iron oxide uh, uh, sample and uh, we have done all the MR measurements for them. And here you see the, um, the main result is that uh, uh, the substantial uh, the EB effect is acquired below the spin or area transitions, which further reduces the high chemical pressure on of nickel. EB field is found to be 5.7 kilo isters at 5 Kelvin, revealing a large value compared to similar zero field cooled EB systems. So this has been again, it is already published in uh, Materials Research Aspect 2020. And uh, these are uh, the, some of the results which have come out of the MR system. This is a kind of in-house research wherein our uh, uh, senior research fellow, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Balram Thakur uh, has been doing and uh, he has got this publication in High Impact Journal Carbon and here he has uh, tried to explore the origin of magnetism in uh, amorphous uh, carbon thin film and uh, he has also uh, done the DFT calculation for this and that's what I was mentioning uh, to two, three uh, our students are now on to computation which helps them to interpret their experimental results. And uh, that has been a very good thing, very nice thing. And uh, this one, he has got it published in uh, Carbon. So the another one of our students, his student, Sujay Chakravarti student, Mr. Dina Nath, has uh, found uh, this an aluminum nitride uh, uh, fifth thin films, which he has made. He has tried to find out uh, <coughs> the uh, ferromagnetism, the room temperature ferromagnetism, uh, of this film and he has found that uh, he wants to rule out the presence of magnetic impurities that is very important and so we have to rule out the presence of magnetic impurities and show what is contributing to this origin of magnetism that has been his now quest and he is working on the, this one aluminum nitride uh, thin films then i go over to now the other part where uh, dr shamima and her students are working on uh, uh, mostly on polymer and comp polymer composites, which has uh, physiometric applications. So I just start with this, wherein our uh, Mr. Abhishek Thakur is in fourth year of PhD and he has uh, uh, done uh, several experiments wherein he has incorporated uh, cadmium sulfide into PVDF uh, and then uh, looked at the kind of uh, increase, enhancement of electroactive phases. So he's looking for a phase which shows more electroactive uh, nature, uh, piezoelectric property, and therefore, uh, in this case, cadmium sulfide incorporated PVDF, it shows enhancement. And later, he has also studied uh, with the P-block salts like uh, indium, 
uh, tin and antimony salts and then he has found uh, that uh, uh, that it's a fraction of the electroelectric phases in samples and by looking at this table if you look at this table you see that the uh, antimony uh, composite with the pvdf shows the maximum fraction of electroelectric phase so this is the work of uh, abhishek takur he has already got three first author papers and he will be uh, ready for submission of thesis at the maybe another one year or so this is in house research and the other student of uh, dr shamima hussein uh, siddharth dam he is working on uh, mos2 films the transition metal chalcogenides and here he has studied first of all to synthesize these free standing films so uh, here you see he is dash deposited and annealed he is showing the some compact films are observed and they are dense with annealing he has also done the iv characteristics and uh, he has also tried to interpret uh, the measurement using the uh, band picture and so on and he has told the type 2 band alignment is observed for this kind of uh, films he has grown and this is published in materialia 2020 and he has now this is grown with on the uh, what is the kind of film the silicon i think and this is grown on ito ito and here you see that uh, with this the characteristics are changing and uh, in this case the valence band maxima are found to be 0.76 ev for the mos2 thin films so the uh, different kinds of uh, studies are done with this kind of uh, substrates and so on so this will continue for him and he will be able to uh, finish the work in one year so this is again uh, another uh, dst student of uh, dr shamima uh, mr mandeep jangra and he has just started his work and uh, on uh, pvdf mos2 films so studies of pvdf mos just it has started so still uh, concrete results so you have to emerge in this case he has studied pvdf with mos2 composite and in this case he has done uh, copolymer so he has tried to grow copolymer pvdf with the speed dot pss copolymer thin films of uh, and he has tried to uh, measure the iv characteristics and so on but further uh, characterizations and interpretation are necessary to understand it better and that he is now uh, involved in now this is some results from uh, crs users uh, for which whom dr shamima is collaborating uh, dr a bahadur from kalasalingam university and here uh, they have grown this uh, gadolinium doped nickel molybdate and when they are uh, and this one is another one this is gadolinium doped nickel molybdate and they have done this uh, uh, raman for them and this is uh, with uh, dr sri mariyappan nit kurukshetra where they have uh, enclosed uh, this uh, <coughs> reduced graphene oxide inside refuge reduced graphene oxide this cobalt iron oxide so once you put cobalt iron oxide this kind of wing spherical uh, shapes are formed and this outside uh, surface is uh, graphene oxide and inside you have the cobalt iron oxide and uh, this is quite interesting feature which they have got so further studies are going on on this particular uh, material now uh, these are all single shot users like short term collaboration uh, from uh, north odisha university on zinc oxide they have got uh, scm and uh, raman this is from university of madras mr dr devarajan he has done on scm uh, several scms on this uh, samples and we have sajan from kerala bishop moor college and uh, dr shivaji from university of madras so most of them are like uh, they send the student for short term and then whatever they want acm or uh, uh, raman we just uh, uh, give them it may not be even on collaborative mode we just help them out with the, doing these measurements so now i come to the other faculty uh, dr balai rao his uh, in house research with uh, of uh, dr mr srinivas reddy mr srinivas reddy has been working on uh, enhancement of gravitation in carbon black and here he has used Argo metallic compound ferrocene. With ferrocene, he is able to enhance uh, the gravitation. And as a part of his work, uh, he when he did this one, he found that this iron oxide gets embedded inside this uh, kind of uh, what do you call it uh, carbon shell structure. Carbon shell structure, 
you have this uh, iron oxide embedded core uh, it is embedded and they were interested in this uh, uh, pressure transporting behavior of this oxide so whether the iron oxide which is embedded in this uh, uh, carbon shell whether it, it experiences pressure when external pressure is applied on the carbon shell that's what they wanted to study and yes indeed they when they performed the high pressure uh, experiments at rr cat uh, indoor using cyclotron radiation they found that the pressure experienced with the core is lesser however it is there and uh, because it is less the carbon shells are resisting the applied external pressure and they are now interpreting more interpretation and uh, discussion is going on on uh, these results Uh, the other student who has joined only last year, Mr. Shomesh, he is uh, interested in this uh, controlled synthesis of nanoparticles using carbonaceous materials. And uh, right now it is in a very early stage. So he is even uh, very secretive about the kind of carbonaceous material he is using and uh, to get this carbon embedded nanoparticles. So this is the kind of uh, initial results he has got on this uh, uh, final product which is cupric oxide nanoparticles. Uh, these are the patterns, carbon uh, patterns of that. And then uh, this further, he has to continue this work uh, and understand the results better. Then uh, some collaborative work with uh, Dr. Bale Rao on uh, this uh, calcium, iron, calcium and transition metal uh, cathodes. Hello? Uh, uh, this one uh, where yes, he has helped. Hello? Yes, is, is it okay? Yes, you can continue, sir. No problem. Okay. okay. So uh, he has done on this uh, calcium and cathodes and uh, all these anodes and so on. So these are all solid oxide field materials which our uh, collaborators are interested in. These are the collaborators from Anna University Chennai Crystal Growth Center, uh, Dr. Subha Singh and uh, Dr. K. Baskar, and we have carried out the XRD for them and these uh, Raman measurements for them and uh, we are also collaborators in this particular work. So this is a kind of uh, directly uh, directed basic research application kind of thing is there. So how to then uh, get this uh, get your work done uh, at Kalpakam node. Many people which uh, many people last year also I found that uh, many students from uh, northern uh, part of India, they get put off uh, by the location of uh, Kalpakam node. Kalpakam node is deep in say Tamil Nadu and uh, away from the city. However, I can assure them it is a beautiful place as I showed you in the several slides. I showed you it's a beautiful place. Lot of facilities are available. Only we are waiting for you. So these are the modes by which you can uh, utilize these uh, uh, facilities. One is single shot mode where you just write to us and then uh, the time will be allotted to you and can, you can come and use uh, the facility. And it has been going on until uh, uh, March this year, but however, now to go back to the normalcy, it may take a couple of months. I believe, I believe that by Jan 21, situation should be much better and you should be able to utilize these facilities by single shot mode. There are long-term collaboration where basically the student can spend more time. I think uh, it's around 90 days he can he or she can spend in uh, Kalpakam node. We are providing accommodation and we are also giving you uh, TA and uh, they can spend here, complete all their measurements and go. So these are all wonderful opportunities for PhD students and uh, I request that uh, all the faculty uh, encourage them uh, to utilize these modes. And, uh, they, and you should know the call for proposals is announced every year and we are uh, for long term collaborations we are taking. However, this year we are unable to do, but I hope that uh, we will have better uh, future uh, next year onwards. We will be able to again go back to our normal CRS call for proposals every March or June we have this call for. And based on the uh, shortlisting and the presentations, these uh, collaborative research schemes are awarded for three years. So this shows that I told you that uh, this MOU was signed in uh, 2007 and then uh, now this MOU is renewed and it is there up to 2023 December, December 2023. And this shows the MOU renewal of the MOU by our uh, director, center director of IGCA, Dr. A.K. Bhaduri, which is uh, this one. And uh, this is ex uh, director of UGC DACSR, Dr. A.K. Sinha. This is 
Dr. Alok Benerji was the center director at the time. And this is uh, Shahju K. Albert, who is the head of material, director of material science group. And this is myself. So this uh, MOU exists until December 2023. So what are the other programs we have? We have this, uh, in addition to the short term, uh, single shot users and the long term users, we also conduct a lot of programs for the uh, Tamil Nadu based. Right? We started with Tamil Nadu last year, Tamil Nadu based students. And uh, I'll show you the 2019 Science Day functions I'm showing you here, wherein I had invited our uh, ex center director, Dr. Ganeshan, and several other professors from uh, University of Madras and Anna University, our local IGCR scientists of IGCR who gave uh, talks on fundamental things to the students. And this is visit by our uh, center director, Calcutta Center, Dr. Abhijit Saha, where he came and then he uh, talked to all our faculty members. And this is a visit of Professor Apparao, Vice Chancellor of the University of Hyderabad. He visited and he saw all these facilities. He was really uh, enamored by these kind of facilities available. And uh, he was telling me that uh, this is uh, not known by many people. So how to outreach? And I'm really happy that uh, we are reaching this Garwal University deep in the valley of, uh, uh, as uh, earlier faculty mentioned that uh, between uh, Deva Prayag and Rudra Prayag, this valley, nice valley on the banks of river Alakananda, we have this. These people should uh, be aware that these facilities are available and they are welcome to come and use these facilities. It was the other science day which we are able to celebrate just before the lockdown period, March 23rd, the lockdown period was that this was, uh, I think, February, February that year, this year. And we had specifically called for, as you can see, a lot of students are there. We had called from colleges uh, where we found this, uh, I mean, it, uh, here I want to mention the previous uh, speaker mentioning some of the efforts they are taking for experiments for PG and UG students. It's a wonderful step. And I think UGC, the CSR should contribute to that one because when I interviewed all these students who are from the very uh, kind of economically backward districts of Tamil Nadu, they do not have experimental facilities at all. People who are in master level, they don't know what is experiment. So this is a very uh, difficult situation. So we had called all of them from various districts of Tamil Nadu and then we had uh, nice experiment. These are our students who are demonstrating uh, fundamental physics experiments to the students with posters and it was a grand success. All these students enjoyed so much these experiments and then we were really encouraged and we would like to continue this process inviting other covering other districts of Tamil Nadu and also the neighboring states. I hope that we will be able to do it from next year onwards because this year we just we were lucky to have this uh, done get it done but we wanted to continue this one every quarter. So that I hope that we will be able to do it. This science day went on very well. Uh, this was uh, attended by our director and other uh, scientists. And uh, here uh, actually uh, Dr. Lakshmi Narasimhan, who was heading our resources uh, management program, he gave a talk on scope and opportunities for science students. Basically, we need to first uh, make them knowledgeable about what is why we have to do science in this country. What is the use? Will they get job? What are the job opportunities? The National Research Lab in Central Universities, in State Universities, what are the opportunities? He gave a nice presentation and I made this talk available to all the students for uh, their knowledge and then further use. So thank you for your patience uh, to all the participants and then uh, welcome to Kalpakam Node. We are very uh, anxiously been waiting for your uh, emails and we are uh, glad that we'll be glad if you come and then use our facilities. So last but not the least, I want to thank the people of Uttarakhand for making it possible for me and my family to visit the Chardam, uh, Badrinath, Kedarnath, Gangotri and Yamunotri and we had a, such a wonderful trip, divine, it was nice pilgrimage and I thank the people of Uttarakhand for helping me and my family to have this trip and we really enjoyed uh, this trip and uh, all Thank those things again, are sir. We, and, we will yes. invite you again soon. We will again invite you soon. Certainly, uh, we look forward. Today morning only I was telling my wife that I want to go to University of Gadwal. <laughs> So of course, this of is course. a wonderful uh, <laughs> opportunity I had. I thank you, uh, Dr. Samalti, 
that you gave me this opportunity to uh, present this slide. Further, I want to say vanakkam in uh, Tamil way and I invite you all uh, to this uh, high technology center, uh, which is uh, the nuclear park, as I told you, where the students will have excellent exposure to various technologies which are uh, coming out of uh, this uh, DAE. And uh, really, I'm happy that I was able to give this talk and uh, make you aware, make the students aware of the facilities available at Kalpakam. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. And Dr. Sudhindra, uh, 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 you are the producer one. I think uh, I cannot operate from here now. You try okay. to select your uh, pick. Uh, okay. And uh, I, uh, okay. I will share myself. I, yeah, yeah, you share yourself. Okay. That's good. I think, yeah, screen one. No. Is it possible for you? Uh, okay. No, it is. Because I'm also unable. No, right. Let me check oh, what is going on. Okay. Anyway. Uh, anyway, we can continue uh, with the without wasting the time. We can co continue with the search. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me check uh, if I can do something. Yes, yes, yes. I can do, sir. Sir, sir, okay. please. please uh, okay, I can take it. Actually, it was yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Doctor Sudendra, over to yeah. you now. Uh, I'm taking you live. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chandrasekhar, for your, such a detailed and very elaborate talk. Uh, I think uh, there was a few queries uh, which I think you have already covered in your uh, uh, lectures. So I, I would like to thank you very much for your lecture. And uh, with that, I think we can uh, end this today's sessions. And uh, tomorrow morning again, we can uh, uh, come back and we can start our last day of, of our workshop. I hope that uh, my lecture was like a campaign. Uh, lecture <laughs> to the no, students no, of Karwar right. University because uh, we need students. Yes, and uh, once they actually, I forgot to tell that they should qualify for just and appear for the interview so that yeah. they can get selected. And we should encourage them to visit a lot of places because many are afraid to move out of their hometown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That is, so true, that that is, is the uh, difficulty we have. Uh, we are unable to convince them. Last year, yeah. we had three students who were, uh, whom we selected, but out of three, only one joined. Oh. And uh, really, it requires for the students a lot of courage to go to South because they, finally they will end up uh, eating sambar and uh, dosa, no? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. it's, I, it's a truth because there is one student from Maharashtra, he came. He was uh -huh. a wonderful student, but uh -huh. he did not stay for even for one week. After one week, he said, sir, this uh, sambar is really troubling me. <laughs> and uh, he fell sick. Oh, yeah. He fell yeah. sick. And his brother came and took him away. Oh, no. uh -huh. So this uh, is an issue, but uh, but I want to give you this example that other students from other states, they have survived. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He from Himachal Pradesh, Abhishek Tagur, he has survived. He has nicely yeah. adjusted. Now I think he will change over to curd rice. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that is good to have a variety in our. I think uh, it was a very good talk, Dr. Chandrasekhar, and thank you very much for taking your time, your valuable whole forenoon. And no, then no, 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 it, it was my duty only. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Simalti, can you please conclude? Yes. Sir. And tomorrow's program also. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar, it was really it was a eye-opening session, and. Uh, uh, Personally, I'm very happy that uh, I would be the, in the pivotal role in, you know, uh, in showing the unity of India from Badrinath, from Himalayas to Arabian Sea to way of Bengal, okay, <laughs> and uh, Ganga yes, Sagar. Sundarbans, that's, that's Sundarbans, we say Sundarbans. <laughs> yeah, Sundarbans, Calcutta, okay, that's wonderful. It's a uh, wonderful experience and uh, enlightening experience. So, uh, I hope this is... Uh, my personally, I am also um, going on this mission to disseminate the uh, research endeavors and the people and the dedication from the uh, the kind of dedication you people are showing in the field of research. This must be disseminated so that the students can get the maximum benefit. I remember I would like to uh, quote, sir, 
uh, that uh, from where I'm sitting, 200, uh, the China border is just 200 kilometers. Okay. So, you, but you were telling, just I would like to add that thing, that one of, this, one of my students in 2014 planned to visit the indoor center. So, uh, as she's is a girl student of my, uh, uh, she, she was doing the final research project so of the uh, Amtech, M Pharma. So, when she planned, so she asked her father, Papa, Jana hai. So, so, then Papa asked, her, uh, asked his, one of his neighbor, Yar chalna hai tune. So, for getting her work done, so almost three, a, a delegate of three, four people went with her <laughs> to escort her up to the indoor. And it was very wonderful of indoor people and indoor center that they provided the, you know, uh, accommodation to his father. And also, <laughs> so, this was very wonderful. So actually, these are the things associated. Sir. These are I the want things. to share with you one my experience. Yes, sir. I had a PhD students from Rajasthan. It was a collaborative program between University of Rajasthan and uh, IGCAR, uh, Professor Usha Chandra. Her student was with me, uh, Payal Baid. Wonderful student. We are so happy to have her and so hardworking and focused student. One day she told, sir, I want to go for Deepavali. So Deepavali, when it comes to I always remember of that uh, incident. She went for Deepavali. Their parents have called her and got her married off. She never came back. <laughs> so yes. this situation, no, this is also like, uh, uh, there should be, in addition to your uh, that publication ethics and other things, there should be also gender sensitization program where we treat our girls equally well, that they should also have the opportunity to uh, come up in life, not only boys. With boys, we are taking more risks, but girls we are not taking. Yes, sir. This is the this is the, this is the true uh, situation, and uh, it is part of the university uh, culture to encourage girls also. Uh, so that way we are losing a lot of uh, good people. Yeah. Now, obviously, sir, uh, very government schemes like women scientist scheme of DST and all that they must need to, needed to be disseminated, and uh, many people are are trying to disseminate the thing, but the things to disseminate from each and every corner of India so that the even the uh, our the you know uh, the second half population uh, must get the benefit out of that. So with this note, I would like to conclude this session and uh, tomorrow we will be coming back and uh, most probably we will be to, for tomorrow's session after the lectures uh, we will be we will be having we will have the uh, you know honor to have with us the advisor government of Uttarakhand uh, higher education is the higher education advisor, Professor MSM Rawat. Uh, he will be with us uh, for the uh, valedictory. So with this note, uh, we'll be coming back tomorrow. So, pranam, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much to all <coughs> for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.